also benefit any hand therapist wanting to extend or update their knowledge. But can this work? Is it a viable option? Is it realistic to expect experienced hand therapists to give up their time to help others without any financial incentives? There is a current example which answers a resounding yes to all of these questions. Hand in Hand with Ukraine is an initiative to equip generalist hand therapists in Ukraine to manage the surge in hand injury cases they have been faced with since war broke out. 50 therapists from around the world have volunteered to present weekly webinars to people they have never met in a country they have likely never visited, with great success. And I must say, I have found it a privilege to be a part of this project. How much more could we, as South Africans, come together to strengthen hand therapy care by generalist therapists in our own country? Let's go back to Ntando's case one more time. 10 years ago, I would have found his case completely overwhelming. But what if someone had taught me to rely more on tendon healing timelines than on set protocols? To not focus so much on his injury that I forgot about the bigger picture of him as a person with an occup occupation and an environment. To never underestimate the value of patient education. If I had known that the literature on the stiff hand would help me more than any articles on extensive tendon injuries, that adhesions need resistance, and that I did not need any fancy equipment, then surely I could also have gotten good results, even as a generalist therapist, so that Ntando would be able to return to work and live independently again. We practice hand therapy in a very challenging context, which the literature does not account for, but that does not mean that we need to practice hand therapy in the dark. Through freely accessible online resources, we have the power to equip novice and generalist therapists to provide quality hand injury care in spite of the enormous challenges that they face. Together, we have everything we need to bring them into the light. So what are you going to do to make this possible? Thank you. Sure, thank you, um, Nicola. That's really very inspiring to see how an OT can make a plan and work in the dark, uh, get out of the dark. So thank you so much, and please remember to make your notes, things that you um, kind of remind you of, of the, for the focal question then. Okay, uh, so our next presenter is um, Desiree Bates and Suzanne de Clark. This will be an online, um, a pre-recorded uh, presentation, and they are going to talk about effective referral, barriers, and concerns. Our technicians, there you are. Okay, thank you. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Deshre, and I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to present. Today, I will be presenting our research proposal that looks at the challenges and opportunities regarding referral as it relates to occupational therapy and the treatment of clients with upper limb injuries and conditions. The topic of referral is certainly not foreign to people, and I'm sure that if each of us were to receive a dollar every time we spoke about matters regarding referral, we might all be rather wealthy. In my own professional circles, the subject of referral is often the topic of conversation. And it is in reflection upon this and following a conversation I had with Dr. de Klerk that we deemed it important to perhaps take a closer look at referrals and the impact thereof on our occupational therapy practices. The outcomes of my presentation this morning include unpacking our research proposal, looking at the relevance of referrals for OT practice outcomes, to consider some of the key aspects of effective referral, as well as start identifying some of the barriers, I'll also outline our planned methodology for the research and invite the audience to weigh in with any thoughts as we embark on this research journey. The National Referral Policy of South Africa defines referral as the processes how professionals and institutions communicate and work together to protect, promote and restore the health of an individual. This movement of a patient to another level of care could be internal, upward, downward, or lateral for continuity of care. 
I think the only addition that I could make to this definition would perhaps be to refer to both health and well-being. The National Referral Policy is rather silent on the specifics of actual referral and rather highlights and speaks to the pathways of referral within our healthcare sector. Healthcare in South Africa is hierarchical. Basic healthcare services can be accessed within the community at the public healthcare facilities, but specialized care is dependent on referral to facilities higher up the hierarchy. There are many levels of referral needed to ensure that clients receive the package of care they need to ensure effective, efficient, and holistic care. Ensuring effective referral that seems to be integral to providing quality health care. This movement from one level of care to another is more often than not a requirement for appropriate ma management of upper limb injuries and conditions, as these patients often require attendance at specialized clinics for assessment and treatment. Not only does referral occur between levels of care, but it also occurs laterally between various healthcare disciplines. Effective treatment of the upper limb is reliant on a multidisciplinary approach. The incidence of upper limb conditions and injuries in South Africa are immense and have a broad impact on both our clients as well as, the, as, well as the South African economy. Clients' livelihoods and ability to function in daily life might be greatly impacted by a decrease in function of one or both of the upper limbs, impacting their ability to partake in the workforce and ultimately impacting our economy. Occupational therapists are ideally situated to provide care and treatment for these clients as the treatment of upper limb injuries and conditions form part of our undergraduate curricula. Our research will specifically look at referrals within the Tigerberg substructure of the Cape Metro District. When considering the referral pathways, one needs to recognize the complexity of the processes to provide treatment to this population. A typical referral pathway may comprise of a client who injures their hand at home and attends their local clinic for treatment. The clinic is able to assess that they are unable to attend to the client's injuries adequately, and the client is referred to the district hospital. The district hospital, however, deems the injury is in need of specialized services and refers the clients to a specialized clinic at the tertiary hospital, namely Tigerberg Hospital in the case of our study. After assessment and treatment, the patient is then down referred back to facilities closer to their homes for further treatment. It is important to note, however, that at any of these levels, referral also includes interdisciplinary referral, which is essential to provide a complete, complete package of care and that down referral should consider the availability of necessary services at the next level of care. Occupational therapy is a key part in the package of care that should be offered to clients with upper limb conditions and injuries, helping pro to protect surgical repairs by means of splint fabrication, but also by assisting clients in their return to function. It has been observed that the occupational therapy services offered at each level of care is not known, and this is considered to be a barrier to effective referral. There is no accessible information regarding the physical resources or skills level, skill levels available to effectively treat this population and to inform appropriate referral. In the Tigerberg substructure, interdisciplinary referrals are often handwritten. These referrals are often illegible and may not contain all the relevant information needed for occupational therapists to make informed decision regarding treatment for the clients. As mentioned before, informed referral to the next level of care is also compromised due to poor knowledge of services available at the various levels. Some community healthcare facilities don't offer occupational therapy services and others are ill-equipped to do so, either due to a lack of skills or a lack of resources. Many public health centers offer occupational therapy services by generalist occupational therapists that may, not, that may not have vast experience in the treatment of upper limb injuries or conditions. Considering all of this, it is then reasonable to say that referral is a multifaceted process that should consider both the client and the treating professional to be done effectively and in a manner that protects, promotes and restores the health and well-being of the client. We therefore postulate that the quality of referral content, as well as the method of referral, does not allow for optimal occupational therapy intervention to occur. We further postulate that the lack of knowledge and understanding at the level of 
of the level of skills as well as available physical resources at the different levels of care impacts on the occupational therapy intervention and subsequently the continuation of care. The question that we are asking is what are the challenges and opportunities experienced by occupational therapists related to the referral process and intervention offered to clients with upper limb injury or condition within the Tiger Berg substructure? The aim of this study is to explore and describe the challenges and opportunities experienced by occupational therapists related to referral process and intervention offered to clients with upper limb injury or conditions within the Tigerberg substructure. Our study objectives include exploring and describing the content and methods used during the referral process, exploring and identifying the challenges and opportunities related to the content and method of referral, to explore and describe the available skills and resources at the different levels of care in relation to occupational therapy intervention for clients with upper limb injury or conditions, and to explore and identify the challenges and opportunities concerning skills and resources at the different levels of care in relation to occupational therapy intervention for clients with upper limb injury or conditions. We will use a qualitative descriptive approach as it seeks to understand the phenomenon and perspectives of those who experience it. It will allow for an in-depth exploration of participants' experiences um, and we'll, we will achieve this by using focus group methodology. The focus group approach is particularly useful in the healthcare setting as it allows for the exploration of participants' experiences, attitudes, attitudes as well as their needs. The study population will be occupational therapists employed across the healthcare levels within the Tigerberg substructure that are treating clients with upper limb conditions and injuries. Purpose of sampling will be used as data collection cannot be provided by any other choice of participant. Participants will be invited to join the study by means of an email outlining the purpose of the study. Upon indication of their interest, participants will be contacted telephonically to communicate a time and place that will have been determined by means of a poll. Data collection will commence once a focus group of six to eight participants have been recruited. Written consent will be required from all participants and the first and the second author will facilitate the focus groups and will use an interview guide developed based on the experiential knowledge of the researchers as well as relevant literature. Pseudonyms will be used to ensure confidentiality and an audio recording of the interview will be transcribed verbatim. Bernard's 14 stage framework will be used to analyze the data and thus allow themes to emerge from the data. We are in the process of applying for ethical approval, as well as registering with the National Research Database. We hope that through this research, we will better understand barriers to effective referral and bring to light challenges faced by colleagues on the ground. We hope that mere participation in the focus group may already be the start to better communication practices between the levels of care. Ultimately, we would like our research to highlight the opportunities that exist to improve our referral practices and guide innovation in doing so. We propose that the research will support the notion that improved referral will ultimately aid in improved healthcare services for clients with upper limb conditions and injuries. As this research project is still underway, we would really like to invite you to please share any thoughts you may have had during this presentation that will inform our approach to the focus group. Ideas about concepts to include in our interview questions and so forth. Please feel free to send me an email. It will surely aid, aid us in our research process and strengthen our outputs. And that concludes my talk for today. Thank you so much for your time. So um, any of you who want to contribute some uh, uh, thoughts that can improve uh, their study, so please do so. These students always welcome um, expert advice on their projects.
Okay, so again, write down your questions for the end of the sessions as well as what you think for your focal question tomorrow. The next one is a review of patients with traumatic hand injuries attending the occupational therapy department at the Mapi King Provincial Hospital, and that will be done by Helen Robinson, who is a private in a private practice in Northwest, and um, it's also Tuara Manya Neng um, from the Mapi King Provincial Hospital, also in Potusra. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm presenting a review today of uh, uh, a review that myself and my colleague Tara Manyaneng did on hand injuries presenting to our occupational therapy department. Um, I no longer work there, but uh, in my 30 years almost as an OT, I've spent about 15 years of that working in government settings, rural hospitals, underserved areas, and I'm a generalist and very much uh, see, uh, specialize in seeing a broad range of patients. I'm not a specialist hand therapist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, all right, so why did we decide to do this review? Well. We realized at Mapping Provincial Hospital that we were referred a large number of hand injured patients. So why are we seeing so many hand injured, hand injured patients? Looking at the, looking at the background uh, to uh, our patient referrals, we know that South Africa has a high burden of disease generally. That includes communicable diseases such as TB, HIV, AIDS, GI infection, non-communicable diseases, and um, what I think is the poor cousin really is traumatic hand injuries, um, uh, traumatic injuries generally from accidents and interpersonal violence. Uh, our road traffic mortality is 2.5 times the global rates and our mortality from interpersonal violence is nine times the global rates for men and seven times the global rate for women. And uh, our morbidity, so what we actually see and the impairments that we see are, will be reflective of those high mortality rates. So why do we need to study the demographics of hand injured patients? Why do we need to know this, all this information? So we need to assess the needs in terms of our treatment, what we're doing in terms of treatment and management of hand injured patients. We need to know about equipment and space. We need to know about uh, staff, which is what we're here to, to discuss today. The training that they, our OT staff have, the level of care that they're working at, whether it's uh, district settings, hospital settings, community settings. We need to know whether our services are accessible. We need to look at our therapy needs. Are the treatments that we're pro providing, are they sustainable, effective, financially efficient? We need to consider our rural and disadvantaged service users particularly. And I personally believe that information is power. The more knowledge we have about the client group that we're dealing with, the patient group that we're dealing with, the more power we have to negotiate what's best um, in terms of helping our patients. So the context of the review, Mapping Provincial Hospital is the regional hospital for Central Northwest Province and it al also provides district hospital services for Mapping area. The district that we work in is the central, the central part of the Northwest. There are five sub-districts. The total population is 800 thousand or so, um, of whom more than half are living below the minic minimum living income level, and it's the district with the most underprivileged people in, in the province. 51% of female and 75% of our patients live in rural areas. The main economic uh, backgrounds are ag agriculture, mining, and the public service. Mafeking is the provincial capital of um, Northwest, so we have a lot of public service there. And um, most of our <coughs> Manual workers, uh, informal work, are predominant in terms of people's occupations. <coughs> so we reviewed patient data that we kept over three years. 2014, it's a little bit dated. I did the study a while ago, um, but I do think the findings are still relevant. Uh, we used Excel and EpiInfo to compile the data. 
We looked at age, gender, type of injury, hand dominance, uh, hand, which hand was injured, whether it was the left or the right, whether it was a dominant or non-dominant hand injured. We looked at type of injury, amputation, we classified, it's not easy to classify because of mixed injuries, but um, uh, we looked at amputations, that's mostly finger amputations, sepsis, uh, tendon injuries, nerve injuries, fractures, open and closed, soft tissue injuries, burns, and mixed injuries. So, what were our findings? In terms of the gender and the age of the patients that we saw, we saw a total of 483 patients uh, um, from the data. Um, some incomplete notes, um, so it doesn't fully represent the, the total picture. Um, first of all, in terms of gender, men were more than twice as likely than women to injure their hand. That was stati statistically significant. Um, so we're sitting with a high burden with male patients. And then the 20 to 29 years age group, in terms of age, made up 25% of the patients. And you can see from the bar chart there that our young patients, our 20 to, 14, 20 to 49, even 59, our working age patients made up the predominant um, burden of the hand, hand injuries. Okay, left hand dominance was representative, 91% um, right, uh, nearly 9% left, so uh, was broadly representative of the population norms. And we found that people were more likely to injure their dominant hand, 62% um, against 38%. And then in terms of type of injury, um, Overwhelmingly, more than half the group were fractures and sepsis. Just a note about sepsis, uh, I cl did classify it as a trauma hand injury. Um, sometimes there's no history of trauma or I injury. Um, often there is, um, but I think it, it kind of fits, if we don't have, oh, it kind of fits the, the, the profile of uh, trauma injuries. And, um, uh, we do find that our nerve and mixed injuries are, are mostly most disabling injuries, um, but thankfully they do they are rarer injuries than our fractures, our sepsis, our tendon injuries, even our amputations. Our finger amputations, mostly finger, sometimes thumb. We occasionally see whole hand amputations or arm amputations are very very rare, fortunately. Um, often have the more psychological burden even though functionally finger amputations uh, tend to be less impairing. Um, males, once again, were overrepresented in tendon and mixed injuries, and our over 50s were mostly fractures, particularly women, and burns, uh, children were often overrepresented. So, uh, oh, that's a quick slide there that just shows how our, our referrals increased. They were over doubled in the, in the time period. Why, we don't know why our referrals are increasing. Maybe it's doctor awareness during that, that time, but it could be that injuries are increasing or it could be our population profiles are, are changing, more young people, more old people. Um, so in summary, um, we can see that all ages and genders are affected by hand injuries, but we do see some specific patterns. Uh, hand injuries are especially disabling to manual and casual workers. We know that, and feeds into the, prov uh, the, into the poverty cycle. So uh, people get injured, they can't work, they don't have any income, then they can't come back because they can't afford treatment, worsens the injury, and then this uh, whole pattern, this whole cycle, um, is, becomes present. Um, increasing referrals I spoke about. Sorry. Um, in terms of the wider district, the OT and rehab services have generally, historically, always been very patchy. I think at the time that I did this study, we only had an OT in three of the five sub-districts. Um, it is improving, and it's wonderful to see it improving. It does tend to be community service OTs, and um, our patients travel over 100 kilometers to access therapy, some even, even further. So we have a significant loss to follow up, a significant loss to follow up. I can't overstate how many patients we lose. Um, 
we do need more research into the mechanisms of hand injury for, prevent, for prevention. And of course, we need always more research into our long-term outcomes for our population, the social outcomes, economic uh, outcomes, psychological, and the functional and occupational outcomes. Um, uh, in terms of my focus, as uh, with all these years working as a very much a generalist with uh, hand injuries, um, we need our treatment to focus on home programs, uh, it needs to be home program orientated. Our people cannot come back. They cannot come back. Even you tell them to come back next week, it, it becomes difficult. Um, function, 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 not complicated exercises. We need to stay functional, uh, relevant to people's lives. We need to be highly flexible with our follow-ups. We need to manage edema, was my uh, big thing, especially with our high burns of fractures. As soon as people go home from, uh, from the wards with stiff hands, they, uh, with swollen hands, they come back with stiff hands. Um, and we also need to minimize uh, our complex or time-consuming treatments. Um, I don't, I, I'm not saying don't splint, but splints can be complicated when you do them and you send people out and you don't know when they're going to come back. Um, you can't follow up and they're costly. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not um, undermining the value um, of more complex treatments. Um, but we do have to look carefully about what kind of um, treatments we prioritize. And so generally for hand therapy, um, my, our conclusions are that we know it has to be done by generalists. It is being done by generalists. Um, we are uh, junior staff, community service, inexperienced therapists are largely um, covering the, the hand injuries. Um, we need our treatments to be patient-centered, and we need our tr treatments to be accessible. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Okay, that is valuable data. I think it's um, kind of shocking. It seems that they don't have problems with referrals. So thank you, um, Dylan, for that presentation. The next presentation is Survival, the experience of some novice occupational therapists de delivering hand injury care in South Africa, and Kirsty is going to do that presentation. Thank you. So um, this is one of the, the core studies um, in my PhD um, that has I think me and the clicker might have an issue. Okay, remain calm and do not press multiple times. <laughs> okay, so um, we know that not everyone can access the specialists. Um, and so we need to think about supporting the generalists, and these are often um, therapists in rural, remote, or underserved contexts. And they're two distinct groups. You've got your comserve therapists, and then you've got your post comserve your independent practitioners. And this um, one is going to look at our, our comserve therapists. My research question was, how do generalists or comserve OTs describe their experience of delivering hand injury care? Um, and what are their uh, support and development needs? Uh, I used a qualitative case study design, and we had nine therapists, um, and we collected data in an online community of practice in um, July 2021 to the beginning of last year. Um, we initially started with just fortnightly meetings on MS Teams, but then found that we needed um, real-time troubleshooting um, platforms, so we added WhatsApp to um, the community of practice. For the data collection, we used photo elicitation, facilitated reflection activities, uh, case discussions, and then professional development activities that responded to emerging needs in the group. Um, so we audio recorded the interactions, the WhatsApp data was downloaded, we entered that into in vivo 12, I say we, I, um, and I, I, I conducted um, within case analysis and cross case analysis, but the study really um, focused on the cross case, so th the themes across the group rather than the individual experiences, and I used Vaughan and Clark's um, reflexive thematic analysis. I also used a number of um, strategies to ensure trustworthiness. 
So what I'll present to you today is a composite vignette, which is a, 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 a key aspect of case study research. Um, and then I'll go into the themes and some recommendations. Um, I am putting a lot of info into a short time, so fasten your safety belts. For now, close your eyes if you'd like. Just enjoy this real story. Welcome to my part of the hand therapy world. It's beautiful, isn't it? The rolling green hills dotted with rondavals and grazing animals. Shacks and spaza shops line the dirt road as I approach the hospital. The effect of poverty run very deep in this community, but so does a deep sense of community, a sharing of life in both its beauty and its struggles. This is a typical day, typical in that I navigated the same roads in my little Hyundai and waited patiently for the resident cows to cross our shared road. And I'm here completing my community service year, uh, a strategy that the South African government uses, uses towards delivering quality health care for all, especially in rural and underserved communities. So we'll start the day at the hospital with a psychiatry ward round, and then we have a CP group at nine, and then we head out to the clinic for two, um, two clinic visits and a home visit. Um, and let's hope that the hand patients that I've booked are able to attend their appointments because, as you know, many travel four hours or more to the clinics, and when resources are tight, that just really isn't an option. My first patient, Mrs. Jabavu, speaks English, and this is great for me, but very rare. You can just imagine how client-centered I manage to be most days, gesticulating and using the 10 phrases of eating closer than I know. Collaborative goal setting? How is that even possible without being able to communicate the basics? Anyway, Mrs. Jawabi tells me what happened to her hand. Her husband beat her with an ax. I hold my pose, my horror, my anger for the wrongness of it all, and the fact that I will now proceed to attend to the seemingly smallest of her problems, her lacerated hand. I scan her medical notes to understand what structures have been injured and hopefully repaired, but all I can find is for OT assessment. As usual, I'll be figuring out this diagnosis on my own. I felt overwhelmed by hands most of the year. My hand therapy knowledge and skills feel about as robust as my splinting equipment. You're on your own. It's all on you. You know nothing, or it feels like that, and you figure out the diagnosis, and with some hope you remember, ah, you have a protocol for that, but this doesn't last long as you realize this patient had his tendon repair six weeks ago, and his hand remained safely wrapped in a plaster of Paris backslab. At least that situation didn't require me to make a splint with my 1.6 millimeter thick splinting material that expired two years ago in a frying pan that has two settings, boiling point and off. Anyway, back to Mrs. Jabavu. I've learned to acknowledge the panic and then remind myself, you know the basics. Start with the basics. So that was an amalgamation of the stories of these nine participants who named themselves illusionless optimist, dedicatedly winging it, eager and willing, the bad grad, tired and trying, anxious-sighted outsider, the find -away OT, the solo worker bee, and the growing therapist. Um, a, a small majority were placed in rural areas um, across levels of care um, in five provinces. There were th three themes that were constructed from um, the analysis. The first theme was submerged, and this really captured um, it came from one of the participants said, I had to drown a little. And it, it really came from uh, the, the contextual realities in which um, participants were emerged. So first of all, the circle of poverty was, was a characteristic um, feature. People's lives are characterized by their low socioeconomic statuses. Their livelihoods are focused on survival. Their occupations are unfulfilled. Strain system was the next factor. This strain system was the center of my experience. I often felt that I was spending more time fighting the system than actually working with patients. Contraptions and contractures, and I wish I didn't read this, but that you could hear this said by the participant herself. I had a patient walk into my office with some DIY dynamic splint made by a doctor that's not even an orthopedic surgeon who did a tendon repair bedside. He, the patient, walked in with this contraption, like a very brief doctor's note, and contractures in three of his fingers. The wound went septic. It's very, very frustrating because I feel the doctors are also like guessing what to do with these patients and not managing them properly. So, yeah, co yeah the, the contraptions and contractures really speak to, to the, the capacity for, for appropriate medical management. And then another aspect of the, the being submerged in this context was the insurmountable need. 
job makes me feel hopeless at times, said Bad Grad, and, and uh, Eager and Willen said, nobody in this hospital can fix all these people's problems. And then there was the challenge of connecting through diversity. So uh, engaging with patients and communities very different from themselves and um, attempting to do this well and, and sometimes not being successful, often nav nav very often navigating language barriers and, and cultural differences. Thinking back on patients I saw as a student, it amazes me. We actually had a conversation, whereas I haven't really had a full conversation with a patient this whole year. Some people can speak a little bit of broken English, but that's about it. So that really affects even just the interpersonal relationship that you build. Uh, with a patient, it's very limited, which makes one feel quite isolated from the patient. And then dedicatedly winging it, reflected at the end of the study, I had to be reflective and make a concerted, e concerted effort to be aware of my cultural blinders um, such that I can recognize our shared humanity. Then the second theme was um, starting somewhere. So this captured the being struck by I have no idea to navigating to, okay, I have some idea. Um, Tied and try and said, so now I'm stuck. I have no idea where to go with this hand. She's coming back sometime this week, and then I need to do something, and I have no idea what to do. But there was this process within um, this of, of finding directions, of, of moving from that stage of having no idea. I obviously didn't know much about hands at all, but I'm an avid Googler. So whenever something is there, I'm not, um, I, I, I'm not shy of taking out my phone and looking up what or how or why. But there's also that, this thing about the lack of diagnosis. So it's one thing being able to Google a diagnosis, but when you don't have one, that's an added challenge. And then I know there's a protocol, but... Um, captures, um, I think, really what Nicola um, shared with us, um, when a hand injury really doesn't fit um, the, the, the picture that we see in our protocols. And then the, the equipping, the, the physical resources um, for hand therapy were sparse. Uh, dedicatedly winning it um, was in Kuzulu Natal at a CHC. I'm the only OT in my department, um, the only ComServe because we're a community health clinic and there are no permanent staff since 2017 in rehab. It's quite hectic, especially because it's quite a busy clinic. I remember the first few weeks was the most overwhelming thing I've ever experienced, especially with hands. I went from having absolutely no clinical um, experience at university and now I'm like, I'm just going to move this slightly. Um, and now I'm like here with this three-year-old child and that's just, and his fingers are burnt and now I must do stuff. And it felt so unethical. And like I'd, I'd run around trying to, to call my supervisor who's in a district hospital and she obviously is also trying uh, to be a therapist there and finding out what I must do. And then rooted in occupation uh, was a very OT specific um, uh, category um, that really spoke to and um, being consolidated into the importance uh, or, or the, the realizing the importance of being occupation-centered um, uh, in, in interactions with patients. So um, one of the participants said, so I guess as a student, I kind of felt that hands was kind of more physio-ish. I didn't really see it as being OT, which, which shifted over the course of the study. And then finally, the dynamics of so thrival. So what, what, what were these factors that, that swung experiences towards or away from um, thriving? And um, the, the participants really loved the word surf thrival because that it felt like that really captured um, their experience. First of all, they were propelled by the demand. By demand, there was just such great demand they had to. And then there was what I've termed a genetic momentum, um, an intrinsic drive to respond to this. So what I actually did, said Solar Workerby, was. Um, I went to a regional hospital. I asked to join them for almost like a job shadowing for two days, just doing their, w just doing their hands OT. Just because in the beginning I was very overwhelmed with how many um, hands patients and, and, um, and feeling very inexperienced. And joining the, the community of practice itself was, was part of that finding out and making a plan. And then uh, support for a learning, were also w the absence or presence of support was incredibly valuable. Um, the most valuable aspect of her session um, was uh, talking through cases and getting on advice on how to approach them. This helped to grow my clinical reasoning as well as provide men mentorship that was desperately needed. So this actually related to the community of practice itself, but um, that, that support in learning was important. 
and then resources. So resources is very broad. Um, this specific quote reflects um, being able to refer um, someone to receive a referral and see the patient. That was a, a huge um, resource, but obviously physical resources were included. And then emotional um, supports. Um, one therapist reflected uh, after the year, she said, I needed a psychologist to make it through the year. She was a, a very deep rural on her own. Um, and then finally, there were, in analysis, I thought, what, you know, what are these things that, are, that, that make or break, that make a difference? Um, and um, this quote says, access to mentorship programs and real-time support, the COP is a wonderful benefit. The, the aspect of, of real-time, um, when I need the help, was incredibly valuable, and expertise. Um, it is very helpful um, having peers but having access to, to expertise and then having access to support um, within that was, was considered very helpful. So from this, we developed a list of, of recommended supports and, and the whole group agreed on, on what we would propose from our experiences. Firstly, system and service related interventions. M more broadly, um, systemic um, development. We've, uh, Helen, talked about um, you know, the, the poverty cycle, so a problem much bigger than ourselves. But then also the need to, to, for, for OT resourcing or human resourcing in other sectors. The OT in health cannot do the job that the OT in labor um, and OT um, in education, um, et cetera, um, can do. And um, I think in the Western Cape at the moment, they've, they've just started um, developing posts for, um, Rodney, you'll be able to, to correct me, um, the whole society approach to health um, posts that focus not directly within facilities. Um, so, so thinking, uh, you know, outside of health facilities, extending um, uh, our, our contribution. Then, if it's not obvious, improvement in the basic management of hand injuries um, and conditions. Um, we really, uh, and I'm glad one of our surgeons is with us. Um, then strengthening human resources in medical and surgical services, strengthening referral systems, human resources and to, re to reduce language discordance. So, um, sorry, the brackets are the, 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 the categories that, that these emerged from. Um, really, we need to train therapists that reflect the demographic of the patients we serve, but then we also need other strategies to overcome language discordance, including interpreters. Um, and then strengthening supervision capacity and, and, and supervision that really responds to emerging needs. Um, and then um, accessible um, uh, supervision or support and th this access to expertise. And then also what, what sort of knowledge skills and professional behaviors um, do these students, do these um, therapists need to acquire? What opportunities do they need? Oh, sorry for the horrible list. but. Um, Guidance and feedback were, were another one of those slightly aha moments. It's this, this process of learning where you test your knowledge against something, you get feedback, and you consolidate. So this, this guidance and feedback is what is needed, and that, that can be achieved through, through many different um, ways. So um, incorporating those into um, uh, different strategies is important. Um, there were specific conditions that, that, that participants needed to, to develop expertise in. Um, I see I'm running out of time, I don't understand. Um, and they highlighted as well that we mustn't forget um, the um, hemiplegic upper limb in, in our consideration of these topics. Um, and then, uh, and let me just skip to the ones that are the most important. Um, physical resources. Um, we, as a group, um, talked about our needs for physical resources, and the next group will, will talk about that. But you actually need the equipment and resources to do the job. Appropriate guidelines that address these contextual realities. Um, mobile resources that you can take from clinic to clinic. Um, there, and resources that are suitable not just for hands, but for diverse caseload. Um, and um, appropriate resources, appropriate um, courses. And then emotional support across all the themes. Um, preparation for community service, so that, that going into that, um, uh, therapists know what to expect, and then um, opportunities to debrief and share, um, and supported reflection. Um, and above all, thank you to these nine participants who um, yeah, enabled us to learn from their uh, rich experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Gideon.
PTSD, also a fantastic project, an amazing, amazing information that's coming from that, and um, lots of things that we can do about it. So the next group, um, it seems like it's Kirsty's um, undergraduate um, research group. So that is hand therapy on the move, taking hand therapy to the harder to reach communities. So um, uh, who's going to present that? Okay, so Melissa. Um, so uh, these students were Melissa, uh, Bester, Kyra uh, Steenkamp, Joanne Fisser, Amy Button, Lauren Holman, Darren Palman, Zerilda Grecock, Anna Foley, Carla Jones, Jess Dubert, and obviously Kirsty. Good morning. Uh, so just to clarify, I've got Kira with me who's going to be presenting the second part of the slideshow. Thank you. All right, so good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you Hand Therapy on the Move, Taking this Therapy to Harder to Reach Communities. Do I click somewhere? This one. In the middle. The right. Okay, so just a disclaimer, there were no conflicts of interest. Um, we completed our compulsory community service here in rural and semi-urban settings. I don't want to press too much. There we go. Okay, so this is us, the researchers. Uh, we were spread across five out of nine provinces. And our practice innovation that we present today it was born out of our um, common challenges that we had and experiencing delivery experiencing uh, the delivery of hand therapy to the rural and underserved settings. So we traveled to numerous hospitals and clinics. Uh, we often went through rough terrain and we were setting up hand therapy clinics in less than ideal spaces. All right, so our research uh, question that we posed was what would a hand therapy kit, um, portable hand therapy kit look like if it were to be responsive to um, South Africa's underserved practice realities and support of local, uh, responsive to local evidence and practice realities. Uh, so we used a case report design which was employed. So we reviewed local evidence and we found that um, a lot of the evidence pointed to a lot of the practice realities that we experienced ourselves. We had often a lack of resources, lack of supervision, we had high caseloads, we often had to then work with, with uh, language barriers, and often patients had very much poor adherence to protocols um, or home programs. Um, we also saw that there's a need for a return to work um, protocol or guideline for us. And then also that the literature indicated that many of the hand therapy services were now being delivered by novice therapists. So we reviewed our realities and uh, we set about documenting this. So this was in an, a face-to-face -face, um, meeting as well as online collaborative documents. We then, um, there we go, perfect. All right, our, our realities were quite challenging. We did clinics and home visits as well as um, going to different settings to, in order to treat our patients. So often we didn't have a lot of resources. There might not be um, electricity or power to have a splinting pan running. So often we had to make a plan. So we treated quite a variety of patients. Got a little bit short, <laughs> but that's okay. All right, so we, often, we seek to respond to the needs of our patients. We found that many of them were working in different occupations. Many were mothers, laborers, um, our domestic workers, and often these were the patients who were injured and we needed to get them back to work into realities. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so often many patients were unemployed. They were relying on disability grants and they didn't fully understand their hand therapy condition or their hand condition and this also impacted their ability to comply to home exercise programs, especially with the hand, with the language barrier. So our review of the sources of evidence led to the uh, development of a list of specifications that we used to design a portable hand therapy kit. So the bag was made out of traditional um, uh, South African treasury fabric. It had um, um, uh, 
carriers to be carried and as well as wheels to be pulled. It was also inside contained a three um, drawer plastic unit and then the top drawer had our splinting plan and then a fold up table as well. Okay, perfect. All right, so in the different drawers, we had basic replenishable splinting uh, equipment, as well as acute re rehab materials, objects for preparatory activities, contextually relevant um, activities for occupation-based therapy. The total cost of a prototype in South Africa is 4,400 Rand, and the unit's cost can be reduced if we are producing multiple hand therapy stations. So to pilot the kit, we allocated two of, two of the stations to two therap uh, therapists in deep rural South Africa. These were two out of seven who responded to our advert for volunteers to pilot the station, and preliminary feedback was, was given from these therapists. So overall, there was quite a, a positive um, response about the, uh, the use of the kit. They did give us a few things that we could work on and how this will further implicate for the final uh, kit. So ideally, a hand therapy on the, um, so, um, on the move station should be available to every therapist who is um, delivering hand therapy services to the rural or underserved uh, settings in South Africa. And we're looking to getting towards uh, investigating whether um, this item could be added on government tender. So we'd like to also share this design uh, through publication to, low t to other low to middle income countries so that they can adapt it to suit their delivery needs. Additionally, we would like to um, add guidelines to the kits from experts in order to make it more uh, user friendly and assist, assist our generalist practitioners. And we'd like to look at um, use of protocols, exercises, guidelines, contacts with experts, and then standardized equip, um, assessments for appropriate for rural practice. With us to develop the portable hand therapy kit for the rural and underserved practice in South Africa, and which is responsive to um, local evidence and practice realities. The kit holds the potential to, um, to respond to resource limitations in other developing, uh, developments, uh, developing settings and aid in our pursuit to make hand therapy available to all. Thank you. I'll hand over to Kira. Um, good morning, my name is Kira Sienkamp and I'll be presenting feedback from my own experience using the kit now in 2023 and on behalf of two other ComServe OTs from 2022, Lalenja and Karen, to showcase how the kit has aided in providing the essential service of bringing hand therapy to rural communities. The areas where the kit was trialed have been highlighted to provide context of the communities. Firstly, Isilimela Hospital in rural coastal Eastern Cape, and secondly, Danhauser Community Health Centre in rural northern KwaZulu-Natal, where I'm also currently situated this year. OTs at both placements are not only responsible for in and out patients attending therapy, but also servicing the neighbouring clinics and conducting home visits to those unable to access therapy. The feedback using, from using the splinting kit has been overwhelmingly positive. It's been extremely helpful to both myself and the other ComServe OTs within our respective settings, as it contains many useful items to assist with hand therapy. And this has been particularly beneficial in a resource limited environment, as everything is packed together in the kit and can be transported easily to clinics and home visits within the community. The kit includes everyday items applicable to clients' contexts, which help to eliminate any potential confusion when incorporating them in therapy. The kit has also enabled me as a practitioner to feel more comfortable and confident seeing HANDS clients due to the available resources on hand to provide appropriate treatment. These materials have not only contributed to a quicker turnaround for clients as they are improving and becoming more independent, but have also contributed towards making therapy more meaningful and beneficial to clients. Within a more chronic setting, this does provide some acute experience which has been invaluable. So what worked? Firstly, the kit is portable, making it easy to transport within the community. Splinting and hand therapy materials were readily available and easy to use, but in addition to this, there were many other activity ideas included within the kit to assess and treat hand function and ADL engagement, allowing for treatment to be more occupation-based and meaningful. 
what didn't work. Um, unfortunately, in the heat, the therapeutic would, would melt and become sticky and unusable. Orphicast is also a new and unfamiliar material and there were no instructions as to how to use it appropriately, which made it difficult to utilize during splinting. The splinting bag also broke quite quickly at the Danhauser setting and it was difficult to transport the kit to the clinics and home visits using the trolley, especially in the rural settings as there was uneven terrain, but it could be beneficial in a more urban environment. The amount of items in each drawer also made it difficult to access items quickly, especially when seeing a lot of patients as there were limited dividers. Some recommendations for the kit going forward, using a different type of therapeutic that will not melt as easily, having a refill of consumable items to be listed on tender to reorder once stock runs out, as well as including a checklist for all the items within the kit to keep track of them and to see what has been used and when to replace it. Instructions for Orphicast should be included to utilize it appropriately, as well as using a hot water bottle instead of a heat pack, as people in the community generally don't have access to microwaves. Chalk should be included when creating soft splinting um, material patterns. Hospital pants to be included for dressing activities and weighted cuffs, as well as more assistive devices to help demonstrate compensatory strategies for dressing due to decreased hand function. A heavy duty material and stronger zip should be used for the splinting backpack to improve durability. And finally, a time period for warranty should be put in place for certain items as the splinting, put, uh, the splinting pan stopped working um, quite early on. While improvements can be made, the splinting kit as is has already successfully served many people within the rural communities of South Africa, while enabling new graduate practitioners to feel more comfortable and confident in administering treatment due to available resources and has thus allowed for an incredible advancement in making hand therapy available to all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was a wonderful project and I think very practical and so great to hear some Thank feedback you, on um, using it. So well done. Right, so then the next one is again an uh, online or a digital presentation, the Rural Hand Therapy Project, supporting rural generalist occupational therapists to provide hand injury care. And these are Sue Williams, Gillian Doherty, um, so these two are from Australia, Gail Kings in Kingston from Townsville University, also in Australia, and Anna um, Tynan from Darling Downs Hospital, so all Australians. Okay, so. There we go. Good morning, my name is Sue Williams and I am an occupational therapist and accredited hand therapist who works at Toowoomba Hospital in Queensland, Australia. Today I will be presenting on behalf of our research team on the topic the Rural Hand Therapy Project, supporting rural generalist occupational therapists to provide hand injury care. I grew up in a rural location. I married a man from South Africa, and I am really passionate about this topic. So I can't think of a conference that I have been more excited to attend. Thank you for this opportunity. Research into the Rural Hand Therapy Project has been made possible by funding from ARPOC Health Practitioner Research Scheme and the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation. So what is the context of our project? Toowoomba Hospital is a regional hospital within the Darling Downs Health Service in Queensland, Australia. Toowoomba Hospital Occupational Therapy receives approximately 2,000 referrals for hand therapy per year. About 25% of these patients live between 50 to 340 kilometres from Toowoomba Hospital. Currently, 10 rural generalist occupational therapists with a diverse caseload and a range of experience from new graduate to 20 years experience provide follow-up for hand therapy patients within Darling Downs Health. So what was the problem? Research shows the lack of transport options, distance, staff shortages and availability of therapists skilled in hand therapy impacts rural patients' access to hand therapy. In Australia, at an undergraduate level, only a few lectures in a four-year course are allocated to hand therapy. 
Rural clinicians are required to demonstrate expertise in several different caseloads besides hand therapy and have less access to professional development opportunities. In our health service, over a two year period prior to 2019, some rural therapists expressed low confidence in managing the increasing volume and complexity of hand therapy referrals. The existing model did not meet their needs and poorer clinical outcomes of hand injuries became a potential risk. Thus, we found ourselves in a very similar situation to the one that has brought about this conference. We needed to develop a model of care that supported our rural generalist therapists to provide a specialist skill. This would ensure service equity for rural and remote patients who had sustained a hand injury or surgery. So what solution did we develop? We completed a service evaluation and reviewed the literature and then the Rural Hand Therapy Project model of care was developed from September to November of 2019. This model utilises an occupational therapist who is an accredited hand therapist as the lead clinician. This clinical lead provides initial involvement, comprehensive handovers, case conferences, shared patient care, consistency of contact person and contextual education. This model has been in place for three years and has become standard practice. So the model has six components. The first component is initial involvement by the clinical lead. So the clinical lead in Toowoomba provides the initial appointment for rural patients who have complex injuries or conditions, if needed due to staffing or level of experience at the rural site. This also minimises the medico-legal risk if the lead clinician is subsequently providing advice on the patient's care. The second component is comprehensive handovers. Prior to this project, we used to send brief referrals to rural therapists with minimal additional information, and handovers for ongoing care were emailed in a non-standardised way. Now, with the project in place, medical outpatient notes and initial triaging by the lead clinician are sent with the referral. A timeline for initial review is also included. We also created an email performer to ensure detailed handover of patients initially seen at the Toowoomba Hospital. These changes enable more efficient communication between sites, which in turn reduces medico-legal risk of delayed or inappropriate treatment. It also ensures continuity of care and increased patient safety. The next component is case conferences. We have created weekly or fortnightly case conferences for all rural clusters. These have been very worthwhile. The rural clinician decides the format of the case conference and all open cases or cases of note are discussed. This allows for timely identification of issues, verbal handover and context specific education. The next component is shared patient care. Prior to the implementation of the project, when a patient was referred to a rural location, we discharged them from Toowoomba Hospital Occupational Therapy. Consequently, if a rural therapist contacted the Toowoomba Hospital OT regarding a patient, the clinical history was not readily available. And if an appointment was requested for the patient, the rural therapist was required to write a new referral. The new service delivery model ensures that all rural patient cases remain open at Toowoomba Hospital for a minimum of three months. This allows patients to be easily seen by the clinical lead as needed. Appointments are available for patients to be seen for initial assessment or review by their local therapist with the clinical lead present via telehealth. Furthermore, a rural therapist or a patient can request a review appointment in Toowoomba for complex splinting or face-to-face -face shared care. The fifth component is consistent contact for generalist therapists. The lead clinician has become the consistent main contact for any clinical questions from rural therapists. This has led to greater continuity of information, uniform patient care and decreased clinical risk. And the final component is contextual education. This means that the lead clinician can provide targeted support and education to rural therapists. This usually occurs during case conference or as a result of discussion of a current patient case. The aim here is to increase the capability and skills of the rural OTs in a relevant way. 
that we have commenced a mixed method study to determine if the alternate model of care, the Rural Hand Therapy Project, provides equitable patient care and to explore the rural therapist experience of working within the RHTP. To enable the qualitative component of the study, 10 rural occupational therapists were invited to participate in interviews to explore their experience of the new model. Today I will be discussing the preliminary results from our initial interviews. So five occupational therapists working within the Darling Downs Health Service and who treated patients with hand injuries as part of their rural generalist caseload agreed to be interviewed. These therapists had been working as occupational therapists for 10 to 20 years and providing therapy to hand injured patients for eight and a half to 18 years. Preliminary thematic analysis of the interview transcripts revealed five major themes, staff wellbeing, rural hand therapy project contribution to the local team, communication, impact on patient care, and areas for development. And I will expand on these in the coming slides. So firstly, staff wellbeing. The Rural Hand Therapy Project has had a positive impact on how rural therapists feel about their work. The increased knowledge, opportunities for learning, and perceived support contributed to therapists' sense of wellbeing. A sub-theme was the increase in clinical support due to the Rural Hand Therapy Project. As expressed in the second quote, the structured time allocation for clinical support, including joint problem solving and treatment planning, was highly valued. The use of video conferences for joint patient appointments, case conference and immediate support via phone calls caused therapists to feel more supported in providing hand therapy. There was also a sub-theme about their negative experiences prior to the Rural Hand Therapy Project. Staff commented on their sense of being ill-equipped to treat hand therapy patients prior to the provision of the Rural Hand Therapy Project. This was due either to poor continuity of care between the referring hospital and the local therapist, a lack of confidence, or a scarcity of consumables, including wound care products. And the other sub-theme was the effect on knowledge and confidence. Therapists reported that the opportunities for case discussion and reflection, development of clinical reasoning ability and clinical skills, all increased their knowledge. This increased knowledge, improved preparedness for treatment sessions, and option for joint video conference treatments combined to increase their confidence in the delivery of hand therapy care. And interestingly, an experienced therapist reported that involvement in the Rural Hand Therapy Project had caused her to positively question her clinical practice. So another major theme was the Rural Hand Therapy's contribution to the local team. As explained in the top quote, the Rural Hand Therapy Project provides the depth of knowledge to complement the rural therapist's broad range of knowledge to enable comprehensive patient care. This extra support was valued, particularly at times of extended leave. As the second quote shows, the benefit to other members of the local team was also noted. The rural generalists regularly described the unique challenges of providing hand therapy, the infrequency of certain diagnoses, the impact of reducing staff on a small team, the time criticality of hand therapy, and the consequent deprioritisation of other caseloads. In addition, there was the relevance and cost of formal professional development and the difficulty of having a comprehensive range of consumables for infrequent use. The third theme was communication. Rural therapists reported triaging by the clinical lead improved communication around medical reviews and reported that there were more accurate and thorough referrals. With respect to communication in the development phase, some respondents felt a lack of involvement in the initial development of the Rural Hand Therapy Project, as shown in the bottom quote. Therapists spoke of a number of byproducts of the Rural Hand Therapy Project that led to improved patient care. The Rural Hand Therapy Project resulted in reduced patient travel requirements, which, as explained in the top quote, had psychological, financial and safety benefits. Therapists also reported that the Rural Hand Therapy Project had improved their provision of clinical care. They reported increased availability of consumables, increased confidence and competence in treatment progression, 
and improved clinical communication and joint problem solving. Therapists also spoke of their increased ownership of their patient's care, which is articulated in the bottom quote. The final theme was areas for development. The first sub-theme was staffing of the Rural Hand Therapy Project. Respondents identified that the current workload of the clinical leads and the part-time temporary nature of their funding hampered the realisation of the full potential of the Rural Hand Therapy Project. Rural therapists spoke of having to delay patient treatment to fit with the clinical leads availability for video conferences, being reluctant to ask for incidental support from a busy clinical lead and only having access to patients' medical records, which are scanned by the clinical lead, on specific days. Respondents recommended permanent full-time funding for the clinical lead and administrative assistance as a solution. The second sub-theme was staffing backfill. Respondents who had received temporary staffing backfill via the Rural Hand Therapy Project were keen for this to continue because of the time criticality of care. The third sub-theme was region-wide method of consumable ordering. A desire was expressed for consistency of consumable ordering across the region with assistance from the Rural Hand Therapy Project. And the final sub-theme was professional development. Respondents highlighted the need for increased access to hand therapy specific professional development that was relevant to their caseload and varied levels of experience. They also wanted current region-wide handouts and protocols to be kept up to date. The development of a framework for training new therapists and a contextually relevant way of assessing their competence was also recommended. So in conclusion, through a process of service evaluation, literature review and translation of knowledge into practice, an alternate model of care has been developed to support rural generalist occupational therapists to provide hand injury care. The preliminary results of the initial interviews are positive, with OTs valuing the key features of the new model of care, comprehensive referrals, weekly case conferences and clinical lead availability for shared care video conferences. The model of care increased staff wellbeing, contributed to the local occupational therapy team, enhanced clinical communication and positively impacted patient care. Areas identified for additional support included structured hand therapy specific education, increased funding for the clinical lead position to enable full-time support, guidance regarding consumables ordering and formal provision of staffing backfill. Finally, I would like to acknowledge all of the following occupational therapists who I either work with or do research with. All of these OTs are as interested in providing high quality, equitable hand therapy care or research into that hand therapy care as I am, and I appreciate them. OTs, you've got your comserves and your independent practitioners, and the latter is the focus of this study. Um, I used the same um, study design, but I did um, site visits, in-depth interviews, and, and took field notes for my data collection. Um, and I'm going to, as I said, focus on the within case analysis, um, the vignettes. I'll go over the themes and then um, give my support and development recommendations um, that we developed as a group. So just briefly, um, the, most of these um, participants were in urban settings, one was in rural, um, one was in primary, uh, uh, two regional, one district, and uh, two district um, uh, hospitals. Um, most of them were female. And uh, 
a majority of them were had one to five years experience, um, one had 10 to 15 years experience, and, and one had been in the profession for, he was close to retirement. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Calm, Capable, and Called. You dodge the potholes and beer bottles. If you don't notice two distinct groups in this town, she'll tell you reticently of the ongoing class division. After checking your boots, security allows you into the hospital to find parking on the sprawling long grass grounds. You walk past the line of patients outside trauma, through outpatients where patients routinely wait up to three hours for their folders to be found, in the boxes that fill reception and a nearby storeroom. You understand that a ticket system to address waiting times was installed, but the internet speed that had been signed off for the project was insufficient to support the electronic system, and the TVs and tablets installed in each room remained unused. You pass the office where the sole orthopedic surgeon consults with a cluster of junior doctors who write his clinical notes and learn on the go. There used to be four surgeons, but egos reportedly clashed. Uh, the shortages occasionally show, recently a post-flex 10 repair was splintered in full extension, but the overstretched ortho does good work repairing the damage to hands caused by pungas, knives, glass bottles and grinders. You keep walking. A friendly employer directs you to Allied Health. Without a clock, rehab staff pop in and out of the waiting area, greeting patients and notify their colleagues via WhatsApp that their 10 o'clock has arrived. Meet, capable, calm and cold. She started her morning with a CP patient, she's just finished with a stroke patient, and you join her for a patient with a full house injury. A sense of switching to another cognitive filing cabinet shows on her face. She reads the patient's file and then consults some prepara preparation sh notes she made from the online hands course that she's doing. She greets the patient, calm, anxiety contained, measured, listening. She feels a sense of responsibility and of purpose. To fix this patient's hand is to enable him to return to his work at the car wash in town where the owner insists that if he doesn't return to work immediately, he'll be replaced. She works here because she's called and she loves a challenge. The question is just how long? Working without support or without supervision or recognition. When she arrived in the hospital in 2019, there were no OTs. Now they are four. For now, she's a constant in a service that sees much ebb and flow. Meet long service specialist of sorts. It's hands day for this primary care OT. The patients this morning include a 28 year old with PIP dislocation who is ashamed to admit that he earns 28 rand an hour. The patient with finger fractures caused by Dijeskiterei, the shooting. The man stabbed by his girlfriend with a briar fork. The lady with OA, high BMI and peripheral nerve compression. The lady with bilateral de Quer veins, medial epicondylitis and trigger finger, and the polytrauma PVA patient sent from emergency who needs a wheelchair to go home. Three decades into an OT career and the, gen this, the generalist role is a good fit. The, the variety keeps it interesting and he's his own boss. And it's rewarding. He sometimes feels like a specialist because he's the only resource the patient can access. He's able to retain a holistic view of patients, ensuring that they refer to all the necessary services. The benefit of experience means he's familiar with services, understands prognoses, and makes clinical decisions with greater ease than his novice colleagues. Mentoring these young colleagues in basic hand therapy, uh, yeah, he, he does that. Um, the gang violence flares up occasionally, hindering patients accessing care. But for this long service specialist of sort, he feels quite safe driving to work and popping across the road to the superette. That said, it's not uncommon for people to be mugged for their crutches and wheelchair foot plates stolen for drug money. With high unemployment, job seekers have given up. Clothing factories and engineering works contribute to the repetitive strain injuries that are part of the caseload. Hand injuries from violent crime and gangsterism are common, and stroke and chronic diseases of lifestyle also contribute to a high patient load. His diary is booked up for the next month, but colleagues have stepped in to assist him with some clinics. His supportive team makes all the difference. Meet Sassy for the sake of the service. The hospital is clean, natural light and bright art pieces create a sense of hopefulness. And this hospital is stark contrast to the lived realities of patients. This place is not a safe place to be. Violence, gangsterism and extortion are normal. Most patients are manual labor laborers who typically do piecework. Their homes don't have running water and they carry this commodity in 20 to 30 litre buckets from a communal tap. They cook and boil water on small stoves and wash laundry in tubs. Patients can access good surgery to repair their broken hands, but are then told, don't use your hands for the next three weeks. Many people don't adhere to therapy. The perverse incentive of accessing a disability grant is common. But is it really perverse when, when the patient needs to feed their children? A question that's, that stretches beyond the hospital walls. 
She strives to be decent at everything and hands is challenging, but she's become comfortable admitting that she doesn't know, especially with hands. Despite strained relationships with their referral center and a sense of isolation in the district, she phones and asks for help. If help is not forthcoming, she tells them, you can think I'm dumb and be snarky with me on the phone, that's okay, I'm still going to phone, because it's really not about me, it's about the patient. It's not the patient's fault that I don't know, they're stuck with me right now and I'm going to figure out how to deliver the best possible service. She's been around for almost as long as the hospital has existed, starting as the sole OT. OT was not considered in the initial planning of the hospital, but rehab colleagues motivated for OT services. As the population has grown, services have swelled. With the help of a supportive management team, they now have four full-time locum posts. A reason for persevering, for advocacy, for cycles of service improvement? It's my child, the service, she explains. It's understandable that she's sassy for the sake of the service. Meet just beyond a just right challenge. A breathtaking backdrop of mountains run parallel to her drive to work. You might mistake her, a well-run hospital for a private facility when you see the well-maintained buildings, the not too crowded waiting rooms, the cleanliness and the coffee machine. She's part of a supportive team of three therapists. They have orthopedic surgeons uh, and she's able to order almost all the hand therapy materials that she needs. She just wishes they could use some of that budget to get a locum to help see patients on hand clinic days. But beyond the natural beauty, poverty, low levels of education and unemployment characterize the lives of many of her patients. Interpersonal violence is probably to blame for the majority of hand injuries. She's come a long way in just three and a half years, from the sterling 10% that she achieved for her undergraduate hands exam and her lecturer jokingly tell her you should never go into hands. She studied hands, but she didn't get it. But perhaps one can't get it while concentrating on things like the right place to stick Velcro, rather than sitting opposite a real person with a real hand injury. To figure out where she wanted to be in OT and perhaps to prove her lecturer wrong, she's been intentional about understanding hands in her first years of practice. She created a hands to, do, to learn list and sought out learning opportunities, watching surgeries, requesting clinical exposure, joining a pilot mentorship program, doing as many courses as she could and reflecting on her practice. She's been enabled by colleagues with ex expertise who are happy to teach her, and she's been able to focus on her learning in hands as her caseload is largely limited to hands and neurology. But there aren't enough clinic therapists. She's supposed to be seeing patients with acute or subacute hand injuries, and the rest of rehab should happen at a primary level, but the clinic therapists are overwhelmed. Her supervisor reprimands her for taking too long with patients, but her capacity has grown and she's learning to prioritize but she remains torn between doing a sustainable minimum within her setting and aiming for full functionality with each patient. How does one do less when the patient needs their hands to live? She likes hands very much, but working as a generalist in this setting is just beyond a just right challenge. It's different in the lollies, the rolling hills of the trans sky. Hand rehab is different from what one learns at university. One can't assume that a good protocol will produce a good outcome. It just doesn't work like that in the lollies. It's not unusual to make a splint. Um, she's made a splint from a gutter that, she, uh, that, that I sourced in the scrapyard. <coughs> People live far from the hospital and don't have money to come back for follow-up. So they're nyamazela. They endure until the pain sends them back, often after seeking help from a amankwele or amankwecha. The demand to be resourceful is exciting, but it's demotivating when your patients needs, need surgery, which they're not going to access in an overwhelmed system. It's also different in that people live simple lives. They own their land and live largely subsistence lifestyles, but they also carry many life burdens, many stresses, many kids, money, and death. Hand conditions are common, including arthritis, uh, but teaching joint protection principles looks very different. Um, it looks different for the mother who is caring for a household alone, fetching water at the river and doing laundry by hand. Breaking up tasks isn't an option. The tasks need to be done today for tomorrow it will rain. Road accidents are also common. Minor injuries that turn into major sepsis is common. And interpersonal violence is commonplace. Often alcohol is involved and, or long-held conflict erupts between neighbours and one mama throws hot porridge at another. Abuse in the home is also common. Community assault is also a reality. The, commu the community hangs suspects from trees. Some time ago, three men suspect suspected of raping a girl in the community all developed bilateral radial nerve injuries after being hung. Precious splinting material was made to make splints for these men, two of whom were guilty. So yes, it's different in the lollies. And then finally, I think that's finally, learning to butterfly. 
This city is small town warm, temperature hot, but also hospitable warm. The terrain is arid and the hospital grounds a little weary looking, but the abundance is in the learning opportunities. All 13 therapists in the department take turns to cover hands OPD. They're all generalists doing hands. Learning to Butterfly shares how she took a very passive posture towards learning as a student. She gained a foundational knowledge. She had plenty of field work exposure, but she was a recipient more than a participant in her learning. She chides herself for the missed opportunities of knowing and doing and growing. Her first year shook passivity out of her like a d dust from a rug, rug. If she didn't learn, her patients would suffer. The patients that she took an oath to serve. Translating her acquired knowledge into practice was anything but smooth, the transition often being hijacked by her anxiety and wavering confidence. But incompetence and poor confidence are not a life sentence. She realized that her learning was never going to end. It was actually okay to not know. It just wasn't okay to stay that way. Supervision played a crucial role in, her, in helping her out of her head, quieting the negative internal wheel and teaching her to focus on the clinical picture in front of her. The growth has been gradual. The transformation slow, but she's learning to butterfly. Pangas inflicting damage to hands are common, but injury by gempsbokwering, large antelope horns, or assault with sheep shearers has been seen. But apart from the interpersonal violence, falls and work-related injuries are common. Patients often come from rural and remote areas. Some patients have never been to a hospital, never been in an, in an elevator. Uh, many have been displaced and mistreated um, in the past, and so a mistrust of health professionals isn't surprising. Their culture sees the world through different lenses than the reality that she learned to perceive through her Eurocentric education. So it's a process to build trust, affirm dignity, seek to connect, and to transform together. So there were five uh, themes that emerged um, when analyzing these experiences together. The first one was that delivering hand injury care was both stressful and satisfying. The challenge of wearing multiple hats was incredibly challenging and overwhelming. Um, then the gravity of a hand injury, the risk of doing harm, and the impact of a hand injury of patients' lives weighed heavily on therapists. Um, and then they had this process of not just gathering their wits and, and, and finding calm in the moment, but keeping their wits um, as, as they attended, um, as they treated what they, what they had in front of them. Um, and, and really describe this process of multitasking. Um, and they had the sense of being, feeling very lost, but also finding this journey um, of, of finding their way. They dealt with uncertainty, but they also, th that this uncertainty seemed to be, to be shared as they gained confidence, um, and there was also great reward um, in, in the work. Then the second theme was really captured this learning trajectory or learning journey. Um, so from their undergraduate foundations, um, so it's challenging, SASE, for the sake of the services, the level of knowledge that you come out of a university with, and it's not the fault of the university, there's just too much to cover. I understand things better after I've practiced it. And at an undergraduate level, I never had a hands rotation. My theoretical knowledge only solidifies with pract and practical exposure. Um, so they highlighted some strengths and limitations in undergraduate training. And then they um, had to transition to practice. Um, and um, they had gained this foundational ha hands knowledge, but they had to learn by doing. Um, and there was this challenge of translating their knowledge to practice. And one of the therapists, the rural therapist said, hey, after a year, it's what you make of it. She said, yes, what you learn in undergrad is very helpful in concept, but after that, it's what you make of it. And I have to say, I think I agree, um, but, but we can discuss that a little bit later. And then there were certain things that enabled continuous learning of these therapists. Um, Capable Calm and Cold says, I didn't want to do a master's, I wanted the knowledge to be equipped to help the patients. Most of the therapists voted that they wanted a one-year diploma. Um, so that she's referring to a postgraduate um, program that included a diploma and a master's program, um, but they still changed it to a two-year master's. So I found another course that gave me the skills and knowledge with very practical videos that I could learn from. So a real desire for a practical equipping for hand therapy practice. And then rising to the challenge, what were some of the things that enabled them to rise to this challenge of, of seeing um, hand injured patients? So the self-directed learning was part of it, um, similar to what we saw in the, the comm serves. 
Um, and then everybody else except one made it clear that this was only related to the one therapist. But um, the, the, the rural hospital had an incredibly um, strong culture of, of learning um, and patient-centered care um, and doing that collaboratively, um, which, which created, uh, influenced her own approach to learning. Everybody else said that would have been nice, but that wasn't the case at their hospital or their facility. Um, and then access to expertise, like we saw in the previous study, was um, a really big support. But it was also in that be, being, a, being friendly or approachable. So having people who knew, but people that were also happy to share that expertise. Um, and then fueled clinical reasoning. Um, this therapist talked about um, a, a clinical guidance app for hands, where um, guidelines that are contextually relevant can be accessible when you can't, um, when you're, as she says, where you, when you're in nowhere springs and you don't actually know what to do with the person in front of you, and sometimes you phone and no one answers because everyone's busy, it might be so helpful to have something like this where it's really at your feet. But um, So she's, she's suggesting approved um, clinical guidelines through a, a, a smartphone app. And then uh, one of the features that stood out in their experience was the changing, net, the fact that they worked in systems and these systems changed all the time and they had to learn to traverse those changes. Um, there were significant gaps and cracks um, in the system and one of the therapists spoke very strongly about addressing these one needed to take on a service orientation to delivering your service. You couldn't just think of your own service. She said, we work at different levels, but if it impacts you, it impacts me, because we're having to pick up the slack for each other. Ultimately, it's going to benefit us. It's going to benefit the patient. It's extra money we don't have, but it will pay itself. So looking at a much broader perspective, which, which I, I felt, um, which was very enlightening. And then the impact of having a team. Um, it looked different um, for different therapists, but, but having access was, to a team was very important. It might have been doctors who appreciated what they did or having supervision. And, um, and then also having access to teams and tools. Um, so uh, one thing that came out strongly was, um, I think the physio needs to be a little more actively involved with hands. Their focus is physical. They get so much more in undergraduate studies like joint mobs, and yet for some reason, when we start working, it's a hand injury, so now it's OT. But it's range, range of motion. Range is range is range. It doesn't matter if it's an ankle or a wrist, it's still range. So um, saying, just really advocating f that they would be strengthened by having physios um, have taking a more active role. Um, and also having access to, to materials. Um, and, and a budget that supports um, accessing those. And then once upon a hand injury, um, really just captures the, perhaps again the context um, or the, the, the depth that one actually touches when, when treating a patient with a hand injury. Um, there's, more, there's more to the story. So interpersonal violence is crazy high here. Um, she says, um, Another person says this patient she covers her hand because in the community um, they're going to think that she was bad and now she's cursed. So aspects that impact on social participation of people with, with hand injuries. And then one participant in particular, um, the, the others except for one strongly associated with it or, 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 or accepted this, but um, mentioned that pre patient's previous experience in the health system impacted them, them engaging with therapists and, and a mistrust um, with the therapy process and how OTs needed to, to really um, build trust and rapport um, in addressing that. And then this really relates to the one rural therapist. Um, rural is a different ball game. Um, in varsity, we saw more like tendon injuries and things that people try to, try to fix. We're just trying to manage the disability. There isn't any surgery. So what do you do when, when a structure isn't repaired? Um, attendance rates being very low. Um, and then and lots of complications caused by, by delayed repair. Support and development, individual, team, education, physical resources, services and systems. I'm not going to go through them in depth. Um, perhaps um, as I'm looking through this, I think one thing that did, that did really come out strongly was capitalizing on the role um, of the physio, definitely the need to facilitate clinical reasoning, that that was really an um, essential um, aspect of learning. Um, then in education, some um, 
guidelines for undergraduates um, and postgraduate were given, I can perhaps highlight the postgraduate, we need to fill the DHT gap, practical equipping, self-paced, relevant for rural, with input from rural therapists, possibly with a choice of modules, and CPD needs to be accessible um, and at the right cost, pitch, and location. Um, and then uh, therapists needed the physical resources, and the example of the um, hand therapy on the move kit is over here if anyone would like to take a look um, a little bit later. And then service and system strengthening, I think what stands out here is the need to strengthen hand injury, um, hand injury services or hand, hand surgery services, beg your pardon. But overall, I think interventions should be based on the assumption that every individual works in a system and the service that is transient and has different strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So. In action, we need to tailor our interventions to these strengths and weaknesses to support and development, develop therapists and optimize their hand injury care. And once again, thank you very much to the six participants who participated in this study. Okay, thanks Kirsty. Sure, that is a lot of information, valuable information. It's rich, it's kind of just speaking to you. And so was all the presentations. I'm not a hand therapist, I've never worked in this, um, but yo, it's, it's, it's really giving me a picture of what is going on here and having the Australian presentation and see how even they, they're still strengthening their services and they also have, have these struggles. So now we have time for questions. Um, so any questions from the, dis uh, the presentation so far? No questions. All right, then comments? Okay. Put it on. So um, you can press your green, um, so then I record it as well. Right. Um, thank you very much. And I really want to congratulate the therapists who got together and designed the kit. Um, I think it's something that can definitely make a difference. And the fact that it's been tried out and People have figured out what are the weaknesses, uh, what they can still work with. What I'd like to suggest is um, maybe to let us know, um, as an experienced therapist, I've got a big practice with lots of stuff. And at a certain point, I will be getting rid of it and because I've got lots of doubles and things like that. And it might be useful for um, people like me who want to reduce the amount of things we have mm -hmm. to be able to give it to a group that is going to make use of it because and so after it may be a tea one of the girls that are, are working on that can just come to me and just ask that I can get the information it might be something that sash can actually advertise that there are there might be other people or even just to have like a project saying well let's donate the four we need 4,400 rand for one of these kids and if you know, we have 10 people that will give 400 rand, then we already got there. So it'll be just a great way of uh, supporting the people where they just don't have the resources that we have in, in towns and, and yeah. private practice. Yeah, no, that's fan a fantastic um, suggestion. Yes. Okay, thanks, Ella. All right. Um, any other suggestions, comments? The one thing that I just want to link on with Corian's suggestion is that um, being at the universities now for many years, we sometimes also have outdated um, equipment. It's still working and it can still um, work as a, um, a heating pan or what do you call it? A, 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 a splinting pan. <laughs> um, so that they can also maybe then contribute to this. I see storerooms full of stuff that's outdated, they're not being used, so I think maybe we can appeal to universities as well. Okay, um, yes, uh, Julie. Thank you. Um, Christy, I would like to find out, because you have highlighted one of the key things in your, in your findings, especially when it speaks to undergraduate education when it comes to hand therapy. How can we improve undergraduate hand 
therapy education so that our graduates will go to community service ready. I know very well, we, we all are aware that when it comes to pain therapy, the graduates, they will never perform like us who are already in the field. But are we ready also to embrace them so that we can equip them? Because sometimes we also expect them to come ready for mm -hmm. the service while they are just coming from class. Some of them, they might not even be had an opportunity to be placed in pen units. So what can we do that can also improve their confidence to also deal with pen therapy? Because sometimes us as therapists, we're the ones that we also turn them down, saying that the undergraduate education didn't prepare them. That's what is happening in clinical practice. And some therapists might find that they are not even willing to assist the graduates to learn something. We also contribute to this, but how can we work together as clinicians and also educators so that we bridge the gap in our undergraduate education? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kirsty. You want to answer? Thank you so much, Tuli. Um, could I, could I um, postpone this discussion to the final session? Um, I'll present um, a short study uh, on undergraduate curriculum with some recommendations that are really a, a platform for discussion more than anything else, um, because I think yeah, the points that you're raising are, are incredibly important. Thank you. So in terms of the mobile hand therapy kits, I think you know there's a huge opportunity here. There are a lot of unemployed OTs. And I did a talk yesterday for Taza on tender processes within government. We can get this on tender. Mm -hmm. The mobile splinting pan is on tender. Wow. All, so if somebody can just make up the kit once it's finalized or whatever, why not put it on tender? Mm -hmm. Then it's more accessible. We don't have to go to buy out therapists, don't have to buy out of pocket because that's often what happens. Um, get it on tender. Okay. There's yeah. a huge opportunity here, so, um, and we need to make it accessible. So, yes, it's great that we have this mobile therapy kit, but how are therapists going to access it? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, good evening. All right. Any other? Yes, yes, there. Sorry, I missed you. <laughs> At the risk of opening a can of worms, it's been briefly touched on, but the whole concept of interprofessional practice and education. So starting right from, instead of working in these silos, um, moving beyond these archaic boundaries. So can mm. I just put that out there? Okay, so the can of worms is open. So <laughs> maybe then, um, we can discuss further. Yes, thank you, Dr. Richards. Um, yeah, I, I like the idea of the, um, the OT being this, the, the clinical lead. That works quite well in, in, in KwaZulu Natal, that usually the local doctors don't know. And mm -hmm. um, I think the therapists, they much better at picking up some of the problems. And um, yeah, so they, um, and I think to, to simplify things, non-unions and stiffness and all of those things can always be fixed later, uh, not non-unions and um, tendon ruptures can always be fixed later on. Stiffness can't be fixed. So I think the OTs must be more empowered to just keep things moving. I think they shouldn't be scared of breaking things. They must just move them. Okay. <laughs> so that's a compliment for the OTs as well as a, a suggestion. Yes, thank you. Kirsty, just a comment. Um, your study was on equipping general OTs, but I see a lot of the challenges in your talk is actually on budget and that there's not budgets for splinting material. So it's difficult to address that if you train an OT to do splinting, the splinting material, but you don't have budget for splinting material. So how would you recommend overcoming that challenge in the rural communities? Um, thank you, Isabel, uh, for, for raising that. Um, I think, you know, these problems, it's, a, it's an evolving process of thinking through them. But I think one thing that we, in chatting with my supervisors earlier this week, is the role of provincial and district rehab coordinators in, in um, using policy to um, ensure the, the access of funds, um, so if, as the sort of the, a support to the therapists, because it's often very difficult for that therapist who's just landed in that position to know the who, the when, the why, the how, and the what. Um, Audrey, you want to comment on that? Thanks. Yeah, I just want to say that 
rehab has only been written into the national guidelines this year as pr primary health care essential service. So prior to this, there was no rehab in the national guidelines. So to get budget for these things that are going to be there all the time is going to take time. Mm -hmm. But you can overcome these things by using <laughs> Plaza of Paris, there's a lot of that around, by asking your private colleagues for any of their donations. Um, there are ways around this, um, but yes, I think it's going to take a while for this to actually filter through the system so that st like splinting material is a standard thing that is ordered part of NS, like it doesn't, it's not, it's a stock item. It's no longer an NSI, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. And I think identifying short-term, long-term um, solutions. Great. Thank you. Okay. Stefani and then um, Lindsay. Thanks, Stefani, that's very really useful. Um, Lindsay. Thank you very much, Lillian. Um, mine's also just a comment, but I heard it come through in all these presentations around support and expertise. And I really think that this idea of setting up a community of practice um, and having opportunities to link uh, rural therapists with people who have expertise um, in a, in a way that we allow communication to flow in both directions. Because we're also assuming that people in rural places are less experienced, and that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. They can also share a lot of their experience with us who have more specialist knowledge, um, and so that we can build up those relationships. So I thought that that was really, uh, came through quite strongly mm -hmm. in quite a lot of the presentations, and I think that that's something we really need to think about, both at a university level, which is where I am situated, but within a community of, of OTs and specialists and non-specialists, uh, experienced and non-experienced, and yeah. how we actually build our community together. Yes, definitely, and not only community of OTs, but uh, how um, expertise. Sorry, I know we're about. running out of time. Just one last comment. I completely agree with that, because I just feel sitting here, I'm so inspired to make a difference. And we had a medical project in Uganda, going all the way there, traveling with all our equipment. And we had this moral dilemma where we realized there's so much need in our own country. And while we're traveling to Uganda to go and render medical services there, and now I'm back here and we do render medical services to people in our community that are not able to pay free of charge. But like this type of stuff is the stuff that we would like to be involved in, but we don't have, I don't know how to access mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, 
if we can set up like a communication or a, a organization or something that delivers training or even goes on an outreach to very remote areas like this already between Audrey and Dr. Anton Rocha, things like that, that would be amazing. I think there's so many OTs that would be love doing that. However, we don't necessarily have the NGO or structure or whatever available. So I think we should def definitely brainstorm on that. Thank you, Isabel. Yeah, I think that's a good discussion to start the tea then with. Oh, can we take the last comment then? Audrey? Yes, I agree. It's, um, it came through very strongly, your community of practice and how valuable that is just having that in, in, our, in a small setting like where you can discuss this and, and get another opinion and, and really like go through problem solving and troubleshooting a case. Um, and I think that's really valuable as community of practice. It, it moves away from mentorship and more into like a shared, um, and it, it shouldn't be siloed to OTs. It should include the multidisciplinary team very often because it's not, then it's more holistic as well. Okay, thank you, Audrey. So that's then um, the end of session one. So thank you for your part participation and thank you so much for the presenters. So just one note for the presenters of the second session, session two, um, uh, Hafida asked to please bring your presentations to her now at the start of tea. Okay, thank you. Okay, enjoy tea.
Good morning, everyone. I am presenting on the patient journey mapping, looking at the experiences of patients receiving hand injury care services in Gauteng. So a bit of background to the, to the study. There is limited literature that is available when it comes to the experiences of patients in the healthcare system. And that also includes patients with hand injuries. And the data that is available mostly is quantitative, looking at measures of ROM, pain, um, and hand function factors. So the purpose of this study is to provide a qualitative perspective and also contribute to the body of knowledge that is growing about patient-centered intervention. Okay, so the aim of the study is to describe how hand injured patients experience hand injury care services in Gauteng. And the main objectives are to map the journey of hand injured patients through the healthcare system, to describe the experience of accessing hand injury care services in Gauteng, to describe the experience of accessing OT intervention for hand injury, as well as to describe the overall experience of having a hand injury. This is a qualitative descriptive study and the population um, is patients who have sustained a traumatic hand injury and have been receiving hand injury care services for more than six months. The sampling was um, in two separate settings. One is a private practice, um, it was six participants, and the other in the public sector community health center, six participants as well. So I used um, journey mapping to collect data as well as a review of clinical notes and semi-structured interviews, and the analysis is reflexive thematic analysis. So all four components of trustworthiness were used to ensure credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability of the study. So these are the 12 participants. The ones highlighted in gray are the ones that were from the private practice, and those in white are public sector participants. So it's interesting to note that six, six of the participants um, had an injury because of it, it was a work injury. The other four was due to falls and the other two, one was a car accident and the other one was inflammation. So after the study, these are the preliminary findings. These are the themes and codes that were generated from the study. And the first one that we will be looking at is the spectrum of satisfaction. The codes that were generated from this specific theme were medical mismanagement, inhospitable, turning a blind eye, but to believe people first, as well as COVID and other impacts. Medical mismanagement, one of the participants, Joseph, reported um, when it comes to, Claudia reported, my hand was completely dead like a rubber hand and he just told me, yes, it will get better in time. The physiotherapist suggested I phone a different doctor. They'd done a nerve test and found that I had two nerves that were completely dead. It will take 18 to 24 months for this nerve to heal. I will apparently never have 100% function back. Some of the participants, when it came to medical mismanagement, had quite a few missed injuries in the process of care. In hospitable, Joseph reported, I went to the line, this was on admission. Um, in the emergency department. I went to the line, the blood is coming and that terrible pain and I said, hey, please help me. They said, no, we cannot help you. Just go sit there, wait for these people. They were moving slowly, taking their tea, that one just playing with their books, another one is doing whatsoever on their phone. When you are here having that pain, no one is helping you. I've been here for almost five hours. Each and every person has got this dignity in him on her and or her. They are rough. They talk like you are a small kid. When it came to Batupili, um, this 
specific code that was generated was looking at how a lot of the participants wanted things to be explained to them when they were first admitted um, to emergency. They wanted their fears to be addressed as well as their concerns about their hand injury. Um, they needed their injuries to also be um, dealt with very timelessly um, and with urgency. They wanted that reassuring um, aspect when it came to how the healthcare professionals would speak to them, and they also wanted someone that would be approachable, friendly, welcoming, or helpful. And Joseph said, this lady, it is when I started feeling like she was having that feeling that I am a human being and feeling pain. She was like very patient with me saying, no, you will be okay, it is healing. I do not know if she was a doctor, but she seemed like a well-qualified doctor for how she was treating me. She was taking my pain to be in here. We were both feeling it. She was also making me feel comfortable. Very humble. I will explain. The nicer they treat you, you do not even feel the pain that you are having. And the last, the, um, the last quote that I will be presenting with this theme is turning a blind eye. This specifically was when most of the participants found that their pain was not being addressed um, in the healthcare setting, that it was much easier for them to sort of ignore the kind of treatment that they were receiving. So Ntando said, you know what, as a person, even if you are seeing things, but if you want to be alive, you have to pretend like you are not seeing anything. Yes, there were others that were not talking nicely, but I told myself that it's a hospital, they are working. If you want attention too much, you will end up getting wrong things, so you must be patient. The second theme that was generated is an emotional journey, and these are the codes. The codes were trauma, um, the emotional impact of an injury, loss, coming to terms, as well as the fight and the fatigue. When it came to trauma, Tato said, sometimes it's also calm, like, how do I injure that because I saw how it happened? I see a bit, I feel scared like I'm still there, but I'm not there and I'm at work. Most of the participants also reported having a lot of flashbacks about the incident of, of injury. The emotional impact, Dando said, the pain goes straight to the heart. That's all that is troubling me, that it's hard for me to do whatever and call the kids and they run away. They are tired. I'm used to doing things on my own. I don't have peace in my heart because of the hand. When it came to loss, Dano also said, someone can think that you don't want to do things without knowing that you are fighting inside your heart. You wish to do things, but there is nothing you can do because you are injured. And when it came to loss, it was mostly a loss of hope about recovery as well as um, the sadness that came with the loss of independence because of the injury. Coming to terms, a lot of the participants also were reporting how difficult it was to come to terms with the actual injury, come to terms with, with loss of independence and being able to live their life the way they used to. Joseph said, at the end, in all the questions that I had to myself, I ended up comforting myself and telling myself that, well, I am in this situation. There's nothing I can change. All I need to do is accept and be strong and anticipate what is going to happen. And the last theme, when, when, the last quote when it comes to an emotional journey was the fight and the fatigue. Widumelo said, it's frustrating not to be able to use my hand the way I used to. And I get depressed most of the time because I was just telling Danelle now that I think the journey's been too long. I think it's time for me now to accept, but she's very encouraging, you know, and she sees this hand working. So it was more the experience of injury fatigue and the feelings that the journey of recovery after a hand injury um, the journey was just too long. The third theme was now everything has stopped and some of the codes generated were dependence and aloneness, role inadequacy, my blessing, their burden and pain. Dependence and aloneness, uh, Tato said, when I wanted to wake up, I have to wake the one next to me so she can help me. Bumi said, you know these kids, they look at you to bring home food and that was um, regarding role inadequacy. Ritumelo said, I could pick up that he's frustrated now because I had to call on them for every little thing, every little thing. So I could tell that when he hears me call, you know he's frustrated. Sometimes I could catch a look. And that's my blessing, their burden. That the participants feel blessed to have their family support um, in the event of an injury, but it's also a big burden to the actual family members. When it came to pain, Claudia said, it took me about half an hour just to get up and a while to get to my phone because the pain was really, it's terrible. And I just 
also wanted to touch on the impact of an injury actually on occupation. And this, these are some of the um, things that came up from the participants. They said, I run out of sleep. I had to teach my daughter to cook at 10. It affects my love life, you know that. We had a wedding, I didn't go. I'm going to be there and be useless. I shout at night with frustration. Oh, I can't dry myself. And the fourth theme is the cost. These were the main quotes generated, medical bills that are involved in having a hand injury, the travel costs, um, if a participant has to travel very far to access services, the cost to the family, um, family having to take time off of work to look after um, the person that has sustained a hand injury, as well as having to apply for temporary disability grants. And the final theme was the OT. The codes generated were a lot of the participants viewing OT as training. Um, so the trainer, they also um, said that they got care from OT, as well as viewing OT as the cheerleader. And lastly, the recommendations with all the information that has been presented. One of the most important things that really came up for me um, in this study is that we really need to focus more again on patient-centered intervention. What is most beneficial for the patient and what do they truly desire in care? Um, and we need to uh, look into more resources and infrastructure that need to be put into enabling the execution of the Batupili principles. People first, the patients first. The second recommendation is acknowledging and addressing the emotional impact of a hand injury. What I found with a lot of the participants is that as much as there was the actual physical pain of the injury, what would exacerbate that pain was the emotional pain, the actual loss of function, the loss of your job, um, your inability to live your life the way that you used to. And that was partly one of the biggest things for them is that they want their pain to, to really be addressed. So um, looking at things like, for example, referring patients to trauma counseling um, or psych occupational therapy as well as providing additional support for the family so that they cope with the caregiver burden, focusing on the precious doings for each patient. What is the most important activity for them to be able to do after injury? Looking at pain management, hand injury prevention in work environments. What was also interesting to note in this um, specific study is that none of the injuries were due to interpersonal violence, which is actually what is noted most of the time when it comes to hand injuries. And lastly, most of the participants, all of the participants, saw occupational therapy as some sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so let us continue to be that light. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Tsakane. I also saw that the first study without violence with hand injury, so thank you. Uh, our next presentation is online again. So the precious thing, reflections on the psychological impact of my hand injury. Um, Francois de Water, Ilandi Foster, and Kirsty van Storenbroek. So I've got, I do woodwork as a hobby. I uh, work with my hands, um, more often than not, um, as a relaxation. Um, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by profession and I um, do arts and build things and design woodwork and you know design furniture, etc. So I was working with, um, with a skill saw and um, I was in a hurry, I was careless. I reached in and um, the saw hadn't stopped. Although this has got a guard, the piece of wood was, was jammed in. And I got my, my left hand almost severed, um, just above the palm, um, or between the palm and the fingers, um, right down to bone. So it was, um, by, um, you know, the blood vessels, artery, um, dark blood vessels, um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, connected tissue and um, tendons and things like that. So everything was, was basically severed and the nerves. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was the accident. Um, luckily, I'm right-handed, but I held my hand closed 
and um, to see how bad it was, I released my hand, and um, so I could see the wound, um, and my 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 index finger flopped right down. So I had to sort of pick that up and hold it back again. Um, this guy appeared on the scene and said, "Hi, I'm your your trauma surgeon." <laughs> and my wife said, "Well, I, you know, sort of don't know you from bar of soap." And he said, "No, well, you wouldn't, um, because we, you know." The, um, we, we find ourselves in a, an interesting situation here we need to solve and she said yes but how do I know how good you are and he said this is what I do which I suppose immediately when one says who's going to work on my hand it's, it's like is this guy good enough does he know what he's doing and um, he put my mind at ease straight away it was fantastic absolutely fantastic and I think what made this particular um, uh, surgeon um, very um, uh, real to me is his high EQ. Um, in, in an environment where people tease that doctors are literally mechanics and they fix a body, yes, you get that. Um, but my, um, my experience of him was, um, was completely different. He repaired me, but then he gave me emotional support. He explained to me exactly what he did, what he spent um, time doing, um, which nerves he fixed first, and, and what he spent his, his, his energies on, and the reasons for that. And then he also specifically um, wanted to save the index finger. What was really helpful is his, um, he said, okay, this is what's happened, that's what we're going to fix. And, and then afterwards he said, this is what I focused on. <laughs> At the end of each visit, <laughs> And just help me. And that meant a lot. It's the first time it's happened. Yeah. Oh. So that was pretty emotional. Um, then he asked me about my background and things like that. And part of his deflection was to speak about everything except injury. Um, completely, yeah. Um, but he gave me a hug after every time when I saw him. It became like quite awkward. I was like, okay, this is long enough now. Um, yeah, this is way long enough. Um, and you wouldn't let go. <laughs> um, and that emotional healing was great. It was, that really made a difference. Yeah. And I spent twice a week for six months at the physio trying to get my hand um, mobile again. One may think of a hospital as a um, quite a, um, a clinical isolating place but it became a home to me which was and the people there became um, friends um, you know the people I interacted with on a regular basis um, I found the, the experience with the physio very intimate um, because it was my hand it was they were holding my hand which is this, this precious thing <laughs> um, and you're sitting right across the table from somebody and, and it's it's um, one on one for an hour, twice a week. And what do you talk about? You know, um, and we spoke about everything under the sun while they worked on the hand. And I didn't know at that stage that I, I needed any form of emotional support. And I think that is what was missed, um, or what I missed. And um, who should pick it up? Should the surgeon pick it up? Or should the OT or um, physio pick it up? And the answer is probably none of the above, um, because that's not part of the um, of the process. Um, and that that was to me um, something that was that was missed in the bigger part of, of the picture. Um, but it wasn't um, um, it wasn't due to anybody's um, uh, lack of of care at all. So, yeah. Were you ever guided or prompted to, to seek further emotional support? Or? Not at all. Not at all. Um, yeah, so, um, no, and I didn't realise I needed emotional um, help. Um, yeah, so there was an incident where I had my dirt burden stolen at home and I had to report it to get um, an insurance claim. It was one of those big wheelie bins. So I reported at the police station, next day I got a call 
to say, do I need trauma counselling? I said, no, it's fine. It's only my bin. So, um, so I was all I was offered counselling in that environment, where I suppose that they are used to um, violent trauma, but where there was an accident, and it didn't have to be reported to a police station, um, where where one of the boxes they tick is a trauma counsellor um, and and an assistance. So it was it was com completely missing out of the entire process. And there was no um, box to tick at the hospital or or anywhere else um, about needing needing um, counselling. Um, but I think the bigger caregiving environment was the physio, and um, that was months. And I think that um, that is where it would be a good slot. Um, and once I started with my um, with with a, a, a counselling um, regime, um, I actually mentioned that to the um, physio, and I said, "You, what you guys actually need is a room in this practice with a counsellor um, that is available um, that you can go and speak to." What prompted me is um, I feel vulnerable. I um, had one of the two things at the end of my arms that I could use to protect myself and my family, now suddenly injured. I was in the public with my family and um, there was a perceived physical threat to my family. And my, um, my thoughts were to lash out at the threat um, and lash out violently at the perceived threat, um, which fortunately was subdued by, by the action of, of someone who was, was watching the situation. And, um, and that actually prompted me to go and find help. And that gave me a bigger fright than anything else, wanting to inflict harm to somebody um, because of my own vulnerability. Um, I took full ownership of what had happened to me and also of my healing. And that's where my surgeon really helped a lot. Um, in not feeling sorry for me, and um, he, he was actually quite hard on me, um, in a good way. Um, and uh, he said, right, you've took the bandage off and said, you wash your hand, I'm not going to wash it. Here's the water and the rag and off you go. Um, and, and if I was up to it, he would say, well, you can take your own stitches off. But he stopped just short of that, <laughs> just short of that. Um, and said, no, okay, okay, I'll take your stitches off because I'm up for that. Um, but, but he, he allowed me to own my injury. Um, it's emotionally how you deal with it. And I don't expect um, the physio, OT or surgeon um, or any of the nurses really to guide me um, in that way. I, th I think it's more a role of, of a, a counsellor or trauma counsellor or a psychiatrist or psychologist, whoever, whoever your help happens to be. Um, and I would say someone who's trained in doing that, um, because I think that they can also be harmed by people who are not trained in saying the wrong things. Um, my advice would be take interest in the person, um, try and find out what makes them tick, try and find out what their fears are. As I said earlier, you're sitting very close to this person and talking about um, just about everything under the sun, but for the physio to reach out, um, and find out what's where this patient is at what what part of the journey they're at. Just to ask questions and let them talk. Let the patient talk. Um, you know, leading questions. Um, how does it make you feel? Um, uh, did you consider um, uh, a different hobby, or um, what are your hobbies? Um, what are you going to do now? Have you thought about the next stages? Um, do you have enough support at home? Um, are you taken care of um, to make that person think, um, hang on, I do need help or things like that. And I, th I, think, I think I would have found that line of questioning very helpful. Um, and then going back to the physio, there was, and the OT, um, they had their own stories and they could empathize and share and, and that's what's, what really um, 
what's what's helped me in that environment. So 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 the patient getting to know his caregivers to me was was very important, or her caregivers was very important. Um, um, and the other simple thing was just tell me what you're doing. Um, you know, don't treat me like a piece of meat. Um, um, just speaking to me like I had three brain cells and could understand it was, was really helpful. Um, and the physio did the same. So, and something I felt that was quite healing is um, when the physio was holding my hand, um, it was caring. Um, uh, she has this precious thing, she's holding it and working it and things through like that. So giving my hand out and saying, check it out and letting them people touch it. That was healing. Um, it's only the physio that had that privilege before. Um, and that was personal. It was very, very personal. Yeah. So the, yeah, the doctors will see the patient for a very short while and one or two or, or five, six follow-up visits, take stitches out and sort of post-op thing. But the, the physios have the real privilege of, of that getting to know the personality and getting to work with people, not just, you know, fixing something. Um, so, um, yeah, you should be the envy of doctors. <laughs> that presentation that's also so powerful to just see how this person as an occupational being realized that other people also need this EQ that he mentioned the emotional intelligence um, which we as healthcare professional really need because it, it is quite um, a vulnerable state what the, which the patient are in and now you need to support them there and are we equipped to do that and to um, address the needs that um, Francois shared with us. So that was very powerful. Thank you, um, Lindy, you're standing right there. Um, she is going to talk about the voice of the occupational therapy service unit. So let Francois ask her. Gosh, I hope you can see me over the top of this. <laughs> I need a box. <laughs> um, just wanna get my notes here. Okay, so I'm presenting on behalf of myself and uh, Fiona Breitenbach, who are involved in this project at the University of the Witwatersrand. And I'd also like to acknowledge Elaine Smith, who's no longer part of our team, but who was very involved in the conceptualization of this project. So, occupational therapy professes to be a client-centered profession and that the client's own needs, values, beliefs, and occupation stand at the center of any intervention or interaction. Oh, sorry. However, when it comes to practic practical service delivery, how often are we able to stay true to this maxim? This project was born out of a need to hear service users' experiences of occupational therapy in South Africa in order to inform a comprehensive undergraduate curriculum review currently ongoing at Wits University. However, we think our results can be useful not only in developing uh, responsive curriculums, but also in evaluating current service delivery in South Africa from the service user perspective. So why service users? Why should we listen to them? Service users are the experts of their own lives. They are the ones who actually experience occupational therapy and either derive benefit or not from our services. Service users live the actual experience of occupational therapy as opposed to doing occupational therapy, which is what we, we do. There is also a need to develop a platform for local voices and experiences. Experience is contextual, and thus we need to hear what service users in South Africa have to say about occupational therapy and not just rely on information from the global north. I think we've heard that in earlier presentations as well. So just to give you a quick overview of our methodology, um, we wanted to capture a breadth of experience. So you've listened to a lot of uh, very qualitative research up until this point with in-depth interviews. 
um, we attempted to survey the breadth of experience. And so we created an online service, uh, online survey, sorry, using REDCap, that was quick and easy to complete. The survey collected demographic data um, as well as four open-ended questions which were analyzed using content analysis. And while I'm going to give you um, some quotes from what we the information we received, we couldn't do a full thematic analysis because the, the information isn't um, interview style. Okay. So I wanna hurry to the results. That's why I'm rushing through this part. <laughs> boy, oh boy, did we struggle to get people to fill in our survey. Let me just put that out there. This survey. <laughs> was open for more than six months, and we have a total of 31 participants, but we got the 31, so I'm going to share with you what they had to say. Of these 31 participants who, who filled in our survey, um, just over half, so 55% of the participants were caregivers or parents, so they were reflecting um, predominantly on occupational therapy received by their children, but also by a dependent adult um, person. And then the remainder were persons with disability injury or with neurodiversity, um, identified neurodiversity. The majority of the participants reported having received OT in Gauteng, with over a third receiving OT services in, in a hospital or rehabilitation unit, another third at private practice, and the remainder at school, clinic, or in the home. So you can see there's quite a broad um, representation here. A third of the persons requiring OT had an adult neurological condition, such as stroke. Um, but what is interesting with stroke is that stroke also influences the hand. Um, and I think that what they have to say about uh, rehabilitation is very useful when we think about hand therapy followed by, uh, by an equal amount of pediatric neurological and developmental conditions, which contributed 26% each. And then we had a range of adult psychiatric, adult orthopedic conditions. Um, and the number of responses from hand injury clients is small, despite a concerted effort to recruit them into the, into the project. However, the findings were congruent with what other participants experienced, and we will present those next. So let's start with the positive, right? So just over half the participants reported a positive experience, a 100% great experience with occupational therapy, with improved physical, socio-emotional, or developmental skills, and most importantly, improved everyday functioning. Improved everyday functioning came up again and again and again when people spoke about positive experiences. Many of these participants men mentioned the ability of the occupational therapist to listen to their needs and to assist clients not only in understanding their own abilities again, but also to participate in everyday life again. In essence, positive experiences were closely aligned with experiences that were client-centered client and occupation-focused. There was an even split in the rest of the population between those who reported mixed experiences with some positive, some negative aspects, and those who reported only negative experiences. Um, the negative experiences, and I think this is sometimes hard for us to hear, but we need to hear it. The negative experiences almost always related to the OTE experience not being client-centered, being rigid in following a specific treatment pattern or treatment protocol, not addressing everyday needs and activities. Lack of knowledge, lack of empathy, one participant spoke about being treated as disabled, a lack of communication, and a lack of communication also featured in the negative experiences. One participant even went as far as to say that it would be useful to have a medical professional offering more than Dr. Google at a fair price. We, we also felt that <laughs> when we read it. Finally, participants were asked to describe the characteristics of a great OT. We took their words and created this word cloud using Mentimeter. 
So the larger the word, the more times it was mentioned by participants. The most important characteristics that came out again and again was that OTs should be knowledgeable and skilled in their area of expertise, compassionate in nature and able to be caring, encouraging and supportive, creative problem solvers that help clients come up with innovative solutions to their unique occupational problems, dedicated and client-centered and willing to listen and follow the client's lead. So the key messages, and I, I really encourage you to read these quotes because they are very powerful. The key messages that service users seem to have for OT is that when we stick to our original declared purpose, we create positive experiences that reverberate through both the client and their family's lives. When OTs focus on everyday functional activities that are important to our clients, when we put their needs ahead of our needs or the healthcare system's needs, when we show ourselves to be knowledgeable and confident, yet kind and compassionate at the same time, our value, our service is highly valued. This is our unique contribution of occupational therapy in the health service delivery arena. We are positioned to understand our clients beyond their diagnoses and health needs. Thus, occupational therapists need to develop confidence um, in our flexibility and our ability to straddle the health world, the social world, the educational world, and the world of work. And this is echoed throughout the literature. So, in conclusion, and what do we recommend? What should occupational therapy services look like? Well, I think we actually already know the answer to that. Um, if we seek to be a valued profession, we must meet the needs of our service users. Service users expect occupational therapy to be occupation-focused and client-centered, not only in theory, but also in practice. We therefore recommend that OT sessions, even in heavily impairment-focused fields, such as hand therapy sometimes is, should involve activities that are meaningful for the client. In addition, the most frequently valued characteristic of OTs is kindness and compassion. We recommend that these findings inform curriculum development to ensure that these effective domains are formally assessed to produce graduates who are active listeners and skilled in serving as a bridge between the clinical and the humane. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lindsay, for a, a small sample but valuable information. So um, that's great. Okay, so the next one is um, the, the hand belongs to someone. So I'm looking forward to this one. <laughs> Insights from therapist perspective on patient compliance. Thank you. Thank you, Dalian. Um, I, I think the title echoes what, what um, Lindsay captured in her presentation. The hand belongs to someone. Um, so, a central element of effective health systems is patient compliance. Um, for those of you joining us from out of South Africa, compliance is used, the word compliance is used quite um, uh, frequently um, in our context. Um, and, and it has been identified as a big issue um, in South Africa and substantially impacts hand therapy outcomes. Um, I often, I had a, when, when I was working in clinical practice, I had a, a, a mental picture of a big bin into which we threw the non-compliant patients. That sounds terrible, but it, it, was the pay, uh, it was an ethical dynamic because we had very limited resources. But it was just this generic box um, that we put patients into. And I think that's where the, my desire to understand what, is, what and why are they compliant. Um, We'll also talk a little bit later about what word we use to describe it. So this aimed um, to explore how occupational therapists who routinely treat hand injured patients understand compliance and its perceived barriers and supports. And my presentation does a, a qualitative depth um, and then Emily will follow um, having built on this study looking um, at a cross section of, of the hand therapy population. So it was a qualitative descripti descriptive design um, where we try to, to achieve maximum variation in our sample. Um, we did field visits, in-depth interviews, and took field notes, um, and also um, pursued strategies for trustworthiness. 
We had nine therapists participate, one were male, eight were female, um, most were English or Afrikaans, and one um, therapist was Sepedi or, or spoke Sepulani. Uh, two of the therapists were, from, were working in the private sector at the time, and seven were the public sector, and the median, there was a median of five years of experience, but that ranged between one to 14 years. And so when we asked them, you know, how do they understand um, compliance, um, really they understood it as attending appointments and doing home programs. But in addition, there seemed to be a spectrum of, of perceptions of what compliance was. On the, on the one end, it, um, it was a, a sort of um, conceptualization that they either held themselves or spoke about being held of, um, I give and you do. So I tell you what to do and then you do it and you go home and you do it. Um, and, and where the health professional really is the expert. Um, and then sort of a, a gradual um, shift towards patients taking a bit more ownership. Um, and then a number of them saying it's a shared responsibility. Um, the therapist offers the expertise and the patient owns, um, and that is facilitated and supported by the therapist. And then one therapist in particular talked about her paradigm shift um, from the biomedical model where she really um, had started to conceptualize um, the, the journey with the patient as being a, a collaboration. Um, and th the um, thematic analysis gener generated various barriers and supports. First of all, powerful collaboration. Um, so um, the therapists believed that when you shared power with your clients and collaborated with them, that supported their ability to adhere. Um, one, the rural participants said, this community is so disempowered, they almost don't think they can ask for better or more, um, or allowed to say, listen, what you've given me is not right. Another participant shared, it's not working this thing. Their hand is broken, and I'm, the therapist, like, this thing is your hand. And then whatever surgery or treatment is then prescribed as this, yes and amen, yes, doctor, or yes, whatever I say. So, and in addition, very much echoing what Lindsay has said, um, compliance or adherence was facilitated with authentic client-centered service, um, services, and as well when, when um, care was function-focused. Um, and then, um, also very much echoing what, what Lindsay has said, is that uh, adherence was supported um, when the therapist appreciated what we've called the life and times of an injured hand. So the person um, as a unique being in a unique context. Um, and, and the one therapist um, said, she captured it so nicely, the hand belongs to someone. So we try not to only focus on the hand, but treat holistically. We obviously have boundaries, but we do try, get the story behind the story, identify what are the other factors that actually play a role in this. And um, in the big scheme of their lives, how is, is important is it for them to come to hand therapy, to do the hand therapy when they have to feed their child who's starving, when they have to protect their home because they live in a dangerous environment, when they have to walk how far to get water? In the greater scheme of their lives, how important is it for them to sit every two hours and do their blocking exercises? And I think that just provides a perspective of, yes, um, very needed and, and, and valuable care that we issue, but um, the need to understand the context in which we prescribe it. Um, in addition, um, just aspects of, of a, a society that, that has many fractures. Um, so it's kind of a messed up system, but we understand why they are so desperate and they would often embrace an injury because it, um, if it means they could actually support their family. So this was speaking to about um, uh, trying to get a, a, a disability grant at the expense of, of recovering hand function. And then two very key things that were highlighted is around accessible communication and effective uh, accessible communication and effective education um, and and the strategies that uh, and I won't go into detail now but the strategies that we need to use to ensure we need to educate until the patient understands um, not I've educated tick um, uh, we have to educate until um, the patient has learned and and, and, and that's a, um, a recipient reciprocal process, I suppose. Um, and then lastly, another factor that influences compliance are systems and services. So when the patients feel that you're competent, and I think that's what um, Francois said, uh, you know, when the, the therapist, when, when the surgeon assured him, this is what I do for a living, um, knowing that his, his surgeon was competent um, was helpful. Um, when there is miscommunication um, or non-coordination in the multidisciplinary team, that acts as, as a barrier. Um, and then 
it's small things um, like, well, it's not a small thing, temporary disability grants, again, we're a, a great enabler. Memorizing waiting time, coordinating appointments, text message appointment reminder systems, hospital transport, outreaches, and su successful referral pathways were, were helpful in this. So what are the recommendations? Um, really, uh, perhaps reflecting on our, our posture as we work with our patients um, from a, perhaps a very directive approach to a collaborative co-authoring of, of, the, of the OT process, um, understanding the client and, com and, and, and their context um, and, and the context in which they participate, um, developing knowledge and skill um, for accessible communication, and that's, that's something that we actually need to up upskill in and how to um, um, educate effectively and then um, um, working towards enabling systems and services. And then also reflecting on the term that we use. Um, it matters, it doesn't matter, and I think Emily was gonna talk a little bit more about this, but sometimes language does convey important things, so something that we need to reflect on. Thank you. theme is building nicely. So um, Emily uh, is now going to talk about the factors which affect adherence of hand injured patients and strategies to support that adherence. Good morning um, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to report some key findings in a study that aimed to describe how therapists manage um, and how they understand and manage hand injured patients adherence. So firstly, just a brief background, which I think um, I, at this point maybe it's not necessary for me to do because everyone has highlighted so nicely already, but um, South Africa has a high violence and trauma incidences that contribute to a substantial burden of hand injuries. For many patients, this equates to losing an income making fa hand rehabilitation imperative. Effective hand rehabilitation rests on the nature of the rehabilitation program, but also on the patient's compliance, which has, re which has re been reported to have a substantial impact on the patient outcomes of hand rehabilitation. Understanding compliance from both the patient and provider perspective is important in order to be able to work towards optimizing compliance as well as patient's outcomes. The therapist perspective will be explored in this study as uh, Kirsty alluded to. So just how we went about doing this, we used a descriptive quantitative cross-sectional survey study design. Occupational therapists who routinely treat patients with hand injuries were the population that was studied. An online survey questionnaire was developed in 2020, um, or so rather was data collection was um, done online in 2020, and the research questionnaire was developed using literature and a local study, which is the study that Kirsty just presented. Um, and from there, we had, for refinement, we used hand ex um, experts uh, to assist in the refinement, which I see some of you are here today. Um, so thank you for, for your assistance there. Um, quantitative, descriptive, and content analysis were used for the analysis of, of the data. So first, so what did we find? I will start by highlighting some key demographics. Um, more than half of the participants had treated patients with hand injuries for less than five years. So I think that's quite significant in the context of what we're speaking about today. Participants were equally spread out through the public and private sectors, which was also quite interesting to note. Um, so next we will talk about the definition of compliance. Um, we asked participants how they defined compliance and it was most frequently reported that they defined compliance to be patients attending appointments and patients executing their home programs, patients following the therapist's recommendations or instructions, and patients following home programs including the home exercise programs, splint, splint wear and precautions by the patient. So what was interesting to note here is that the definitions that participants provided placed a significant weight of the responsibility of patient compliance on the patient. However, when we specifically asked with whom the responsibility of compliance lay, participants reported that the responsibility lies with both the patient and the therapist. And nearly a third highlighted that patient compliance also sits with the multidisciplinary team 
and the patient's fam families in addition, to the, in addition to the patient and the therapist. So now, again, something that uh, Kirsty alluded to is that contemporary hand therapy literature cautions us against the use of the term compliance. And so we asked South African um, occupational therapists what term they think is, is most appropriate and is compliance the most appropriate term. And what was very interesting to see is that more than 60% of participants reported that, yes, compliance is the best term to be used. The next objective of the study um, were the factors perceived by therapists to affect patient compliance. So the World Health Organization describes five categories that affect patient compliance, namely health care system and team, socioeconomic, therapy, patient, and condition-related factors. These factors act as both barriers and supports to patient compliance. And next, I will outline some of these barriers and supports. Um, but just of note, I have, I've merely scraped the surface of these barriers and supports. I think for those of you that completed the questionnaire, um, know how lengthy it was. So um, I think that's just a disclaimer. Um, and the, the barriers will be highlighted in red and the supports in green. So first, the most frequently reported healthcare team and system related uh, factors were language barriers, delayed surgeries, inconsistent communication between the multidisciplinary team, cultural sensitivity, th therapists demonstrating a positive expectation of the patient's ability to be compliant, and therapists demonstrating interest and authentic care. The most frequently reported socioeconomic related factors were the cost of travel, the travel time, distance, and difficulty accessing care, the loss of wage or employment during the rehabilitation pro uh, process, um, as well as, oh, sorry, that didn't come up, peer and social support. Next, the most frequently reported therapy-related factors were home programs that interfere with the patient's lifestyle, providing patients with a program that is concrete with visuals, adapting protocols to suit individual patients, grading treatment sensitively according to the patient's response, shared goal setting between therapist and the patient, continually re-evaluating treatment goals with the patient, taking an accurate history and assessment of the injured hand as well as the patient and their context, understanding the patient's narrative and the impact of the injured, injured hand on the patient's function within their context. The most frequently reported patient-related factors were the lack of knowledge about rehabilitation services and rehabilitation itself, knowing what information to what information and how much information will be beneficial to the patient. Then lastly, the most frequently reported condition-related factors were comorbidities, as well as early identification by the therapist of comorbidities that may affect compliance. So in response to these, we asked the participants to provide a strategy that they use for compliance or to assist with their, the barriers that they experience with compliance. Um, and these strategies now will represent the recommendations from, for this presentation to the generalist occupational therapist as to how they can assist their practices in compliance with their patients. So the four most frequently reported categories of the strategies op offered by participants as used, as used by themselves as well as their, their departments was strategies used during therapy, the treatment experience, the type of communication used, and addressing the psychosocial components, which I think has come out very strongly today. Um, so strategies used during therapy were educating patients on their condition and therapy, shared decision-making, goal-setting, and responsibility, informing the patient about the consequences of non-compliance, and home program-related factors. Strategies described as the treatment experience included all follow-up appointments being on the same date, appointment reminders, and decreasing waiting times. Then, in terms of the type of communication used, visuals with written instructions, repetition of instructions and home programs, concrete, simple, and understandable instructions, and making use of the patient's home language or a translator. And then lastly, was the category of addressing the psycho psychosocial components. And this included addressing the patient, assessing the patient holistically, addressing their fears and their concerns, listening to the patient, and building a rapport and strong or good therapeutic relationship with the patient. So, 
the only the only thing that we we can note um, as for, from a take-home message is that there are barriers that weren't there were no recommendations for these, um, and these were some of the frequently reported barriers from the study: the cost of travel, the travel time, distance, and difficulty accessing care, the loss of wage or employment during rehabilitation services, delayed surgeries, and inconsistent communications between the multidisciplinary team. And perhaps strategies weren't provided for these barriers because they're a little bit less easy for us to action and a little bit more out of our control. Um, and so I think to highlight at the end, the, the final take home from this would be to invite all of us, both specialists and generalist occupational therapists, to consider how we can address these factors, the factors that are out of our control, because there have been lovely suggestions as to things that we can do um, within our units, but what can we do with the bigger picture, which is where our patients come from. Thank you. that useful information um, so she got a rather large sample <laughs> um, and it's so valuable these barriers and facilitators that we can use um, so the next one is also about patient experiences but this is patient experience of shared decision making and we have um, a service user Trish Griff Griffiths and with a bicycle of health. Um, so obviously the immediate uh, effect wasn't, uh, yeah, my hands fractured. So then obviously I just, uh, it was just one day, but in the morning it was a bit swollen and more painful after the pain medication I took. And then I went for x-rays um, and then the doctor looked at the x-rays and I got a call and then um, he said, listen, um, you have to go for COVID test because we're operating on you tomorrow. So he said, um, I need to um, have this off tomorrow. Had you seen him at this stage or has he just seen the x-rays? He's just seen the x-rays. Okay. So, and then I said, okay, so I, because everything had to happen, I was just scared, listen, if I delay the process, then I'm not going to have it off. So, and then um, yeah, I went for the COVID test, uh, negative, um, the theatre's booked and everything, so I was booked in and then we had the op. He, um, I can't remember whether he said before and after, uh, no, I think afterwards he told me, listen, this is what we, because he took x-rays mm -hmm. and explained to me what he put in. Okay. So then I saw, you know, the. Uh, the, the splint or the plate, the plate yes. that he put in the plate, yes, yes in the screws. Um, and then obviously um, I discussed it with my wife. He, his opinion was that Theo didn't need, um, you know, so immediate surgery. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. And then I had a plate in for, I think was it six, six months or mm -hmm. plus minus. Yeah. And I still came to you for, for the rehab and you said, listen, um, maybe we must take the plate out sooner than 
<laughs> then later. So, and then he, and we keep it in till whenever, you know, he wants to put it in. And then after we, uh, you know, we made nice progress. I was really happy with the range that I got back with my hand. And then we took out the, the, the plate and the screws um, after about maybe six months, yeah. But, uh, like I said, uh, I only heard afterwards uh, the other doctor's uh, opinion, you know. So, to say, listen, I didn't need the immediate uh, surgery as uh, recommended. I was like, I, I trusted him mm. and his opinion. And then, of course, I thought that, you know, he's got my best interest at heart. Yeah. So, yeah. And, yeah, I actually, I felt I was disappointed in, you know, the way he... To me, I'm gonna put it just frank. Uh, to me, it's maybe just about money. You know, it's like okay, let's get this guy in because this it's gonna cost like so much plus minus, and that's it. Our health, of course. So, but yeah. <laughs> that is disappointing. Yeah. It is. It is disappointing. Do you think you were involved in any of the decisions made? Was it discussed? And no, it wasn't discussed prior or before. So yeah. What's interesting is it sounds like you didn't even have like a like a, a session with the surgeon beforehand, so you didn't even see your hand, but you only saw the X-ray. X-ray, yeah. It, everything happened just like the accident, X-rays the next day, the next day the surgery. So all very fast. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if you had any concerns about the surgery, when were these addressed? Um, I think I saw him. What, what was it? weeks after after, after okay. yeah okay and then because sure. i was uh, still delaying and waiting on him to come discharge me and then the sister came and gave me instructions you know so and and before the surgery how were your feelings towards it i mean were you keen to have the surgery or were you were you worried about the surgery obviously i was worried um i i, I didn't have the knowledge just say, listen, um, no, I, I don't need a surgery, mm -hmm. or um, yes, no, for sure, I, I do need, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then, yeah, like, like I said, if, um, if I had more time mm -hmm. to decide, mm -hmm. then uh, I wouldn't have made the... It was all very rushed. Yeah, it was rushed. So yeah. now, hypothetically speaking, you have an injury and you have a fracture, how would you feel going into another consult with another surgeon? Um, no, no, I would definitely um, discuss it in length, mm -hmm. you know, uh, give me all the options. Mm -hmm. If I don't have the surgery, what will happen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and how long do I have not having the surgery, you know, so, yeah, or, or, or is it maybe, uh, maybe I could have just had the, the plus of parish, maybe just put it in there, maybe I, I don't know, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. maybe I didn't need the, the, the plate and the screws, maybe just uh, a cost. That's it. So, and then I think I would have healed a bit quicker and with the physio and everything. So, at least the other side that I think could have happened. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm James, and I consent to this video being shared and used for its purpose. Um, so yeah, I fractured my hand on a Tuesday evening and went to um, a general doctor the next day who referred me to a, um, referred me for an x-ray, saw the x-ray, um, the break was pretty obvious, so then referred me to a surgeon. So within that day, I saw um, the surgeon in the afternoon and he, explained to me that it was quite a classic um, hand injury called a boxer's injury um, and the options were quite clear is I could um, let the bone heal on its own and do its thing um, but the implications of that would be maybe a bit of a misshapen knuckle um, an awkward kind of bone angle and there might be some issues with um, like grip and my palm and you know some uh, there's a few unknowns with letting the body just do its thing um, and then the other option he talked me through was um, having uh, an operation on it to set and straighten the bone and then use a plate to kind of secure it so kind of very much jump starting the healing process and 
I was told the benefits of that would, it's obviously a lot more um, dependable and within the doctor's control. So the bone can be set nice and straight and then that has a lot faster healing implications and would also mean I'd be able to get full range of movement back and we would know what the outcome would be with a lot more certainty than if we just left it up to the body to decide. Um, so he presented me those options and asked a couple of questions, but it was pretty clear for me that to, to take the surgery, even though it's never really fun having an operation, to take the, take the hit of the surgery in the short term, because in the long term it would greatly benefit my rehab process and basically the quality of life with my hand going forward. So for me it was quite an easy decision in the end because I want my right hand to be my right hand and to do its job. You want to show how much range you've got? So I'm at four weeks after the surgery and it was on my left hand side. So this is the bad finger and Beautiful. pretty much. And in hindsight, are you happy with the decision you made? Yeah, but in hindsight, very happy because I, when you, when I made the decision, I had to consider worst case scenario that it was still going to take time to heal and there'd still be difficulties and I was, it's not guaranteed to get everything back. Mm -hmm. But the surgery is very successful. The therapy has been worked really well, and so far I've I'm on yeah making really good progress. And returning to all activities of daily life, you back to doing all the things you love. Yeah, back to doing pretty much all the things I love. I haven't tried surfing yet, but I um yeah I can do pick things up, do all the chores around the house, which everyone's glad about, and I can I was back typing and working within a week or so. Amazing. Which is very easy. Thank you so much. Cool. Okay, thank you, Kirsty, for arranging this um, videos and the patient um, side of how much they were involved in the decision making. And I think, as OTs in our theory, decision making of the client is very important. Um, but maybe not all health professionals see the value of that. So thank you now for all these contributions in terms of kind of bringing the service user side in um, and how they experience things and what they expect of us. So I hope you still have your sticky notes and you're making your um, ideas or your things that we're going to take forward for tomorrow. Good, so now we've got time for questions. Um, so let's start any specific questions on a specific presentation. Is it on? Okay, cool. Um, so firstly, just thank you to all the presenters for um, highlighting the voices of service users and also just the importance of kindness, care and client-centeredness in therapy. Um, I think my question um, to any of the presenters and even therapists who may have had experience in this area is how does one still carry that over when there's a language barrier? Um, because yeah, it becomes really difficult. You know a limited number of phrases and there's not always an interpreter available and you still want to come across as interested and invested in patient care. Um, but it, it's quite tricky when you don't know which words to use. So, okay, yeah. anyone wants to answer that one? It's a very tricky question. <laughs> Please carry on. Yes, that is a really difficult thing to do, especially because of our lack of, of fluent um, language skills and everything. I do think though that just the way that we approach a patient, touch the patient's hands, um, the, the caring we demonstrate already breaks down a lot of barriers, but a practical problem is really if you tell him how to move the hand and what to go and do, that is a really practical problem. Um, one of the things I did when I used to work in, um, which is now George Macari Hospital, um, was to actually hand out my um, hand programs or the, the programs that they had to do all in pictures so that they could actually look at that. So there was a sun and a moon to try and describe how long you just had to wear a splint and a thing with a tap with it, how to wash the splint and, and activities and things like that, which I um, 
uh, added to that. And I think it made a difference, but that's many years ago. But that mm -hmm. was one thing that I had. If I look carefully, I might find all my <laughs> illustrations still. <laughs> um, Isabel and then Rutini. I think it's also important to just determine what is the main language of the area because I speak limited Sperdi and it doesn't necessarily mean that I speak Sperdi <laughs> but I can help myself functionally in certain settings. So when I'm in a shop, I know exactly what to say to keep a conversation going in that setting. And then I also know the phrase very well for I speak only limited Sperdi. So once they start speaking a lot of Sperdi, I just say, listen, I don't understand what you're saying. But I think, specifically in an occupational therapy setting, if you, if you learn certain phrases, like, do you have pain? Or, go and do this at home, it's very important, this is your responsibility, um, and certain assessment questions. It's a functional area where you actually use the same, like even me, in my private practice, I use the same questions over and over again. So I think if you just compile certain essential things that you need to know from the patient and that you would like to tell to the patient, prioritize them and learn what they are in the language of your area, then that will help you a lot already. And then obviously also pictures. Okay, thank you Isabel. I just want to give Rugini a chance. And then Monique. So I think COVID taught us a lot of things and so videos worked very well. Um, so I think the visual, the picture sometimes, uh, you know, they, they forget what they saw when you're demonstrating. But I think if you can do videos and then find out from the family, uh, from the patient, is there a family member who speaks English or can, uh -huh. you know, because if they can watch the video and go through it with the patient, that helps. So I think videos and especially via WhatsApp, most patients can, not everybody. And then obviously internet and it's, you know, it takes a lot of data. Mm -hmm. We do know that but it seems to wor work well with patients. It, it makes therapy a lot more accessible. Okay, but I think the one aspect that you also said, how do you show this care? So I think doing videos already show you care, you go to the extra length, but it's also just that non-verbals that Corian is saying is, is also important. Monique, then Tabani. I'm reminded of the patients that even if I said, um, greeted them in, is Zulu, how their eyes just light up. And even if I say, Bulongo, you're like, yes. Or um, Lalapansi, you know, a few words, and that shows compassion as well. Okay, Tabani. Google Translate, <laughs> it, helps, it helps me a lot, especially when we get patients, in Big Vigo we get patients from Pumalanga, Limpopo and Northwest, sometimes I would get patients that speak very deep Afrikaans, that <laughs> I know basic, but you, you, so now I will use Google, uh, Google Translate and then I will read what I'm saying, they will laugh at me, it's not always accurate, but then <laughs> correct me, they, they get the idea of what you're trying to say, and they also correlate it with your body language. Mm -hmm. There's also another thing that we are busy with from Gauteng, I know with the OTs in Skendigen, they have actually created a YouTube um, thing for OTs, where if they go to communities and they've recorded themselves, it's, it's unfortunate because we're still at the moment trying to get uh, clearance from Gauteng Department of Health to make that available to to everyone, but there is something that has been done by the OTs in the public sector in Skandinavian region in Joburg, which is specifically for OT and what to ask certain questions relating to communities. Okay, right there at the back, Dr. Richards. Yeah, I think what one thing that the public service gets wrong is trying to use doctors or highly skilled even OTs for too much purpose. Um, so for instance, you, you'll have registrars that's got their degree and now doing a postdoc and they have to draw blood on patients for instance and we don't have, actually all you need is a phlebotomist to, to, to take blood and 
the same for rehabilitation and um, psychological support. So if I have to see everyone from Mozambique to Eastern Cape on a Tuesday morning, oh, on a Thursday morning, it's a Tuesday morning, yeah, then I can't spend time in a holistic approach to them. I really need to see them and add the value that I'm supposed to be adding there. And in places like that, um, having uh, some support from a psychologist or even just community leaders or something to also assist with educating and making a connection to the local places and things, that will help. But I can't, for me to have all that um, experience and then just and using that for an hour on a patient mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense. So yeah. I think the public service really needs to improve on that, you know, on the lower end support. Yeah, I just want to comment on that before I give you a chance to speak. It is so true. Um, when it's limited resources, so apply the skills appropriately and efficiently. Otherwise, yeah, I, I understand your point. Okay, next comment. Just from a patient perspective, I think that um, living in South Africa, we obviously will always have language barrier mm -hmm. as a problem. And I think that um, actions speak louder than words. So um, just as a comment, you know, when it comes to caring for the patient, actions, I mean, if you think about it, nonverbal communication is the biggest form of communication. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that language barrier is actually a problem. It would be more about action. Okay, thank you for that. Tuli. I think the important thing is from us as health workers is the willingness of want to learn from other people. Mm -hmm. Because I know I'm speaking from the experience of being a therapist to become a, a translator for another therapist. And the next thing when the client comes, they think that you are a translator. <laughs> <laughs> and then they don't want you to assist them because you were a translator for another colleague. Mm -hmm. Then then I think as a colleague, you as a therapist, that somebody else is translating for you, be willing to tell the client that this one is also my colleague and is doing the same thing just as you assisting mm. so that we can make the communication easy because it becomes a problem when somebody who's a therapist like myself, a black person, translating for my colleague who's white. And the next thing when they come, the clients, they will say, I don't want to be treated by you. They will leave the ah. premises and go back and come back when the other therapist is back. We need to be careful of that as well. Okay, yeah, I think it links to that comment that um, use your skills effi efficiently and effectively in the situation. Esther. If I could move or come to the point of the service user as part of the team. Um, in all this research, did it come up because it's a very strong concept in South Africa that the service user is not an individual especially in rural areas beyond, goes to the family and sometimes even the community. Did any of these studies pick up anything like that? Are there any? It's a question. Okay, thank you. So is there any um, of the, um, the family set up or, you know, individuals don't make decisions, um, the group must make the decision? Lindsay. we didn't investigate that specifically it was up to people to fill out the survey we did notice in our demographics that more than half was filled out not necessarily by a person with a disability or an injury but a person living with that person and um, I didn't report on it here but that there is definitely so there is um, two different worldviews but even in the Eurocentric worldview, there is still a need for family centeredness. Um, and when the OT was um, receptive or understanding of the whole of the whole context, and not just this person that I need to treat here, that contributes to positive experiences. Um, so it is something we need to take into consideration, and we need to explore more because I don't think there's a lot in the literature that's OT specific. Um, we need to go outside our field to find that information. And an effect on clients and the whole. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, I think it is maybe an important aspect, the collectiveness um, aspect of the patients. 
our clients. More questions, comments? This one, Rugini? Uh, this is just out of curiosity. The last patient video, it was the same therapist with script. I'm just curious to know if it was the same surgeon. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to follow up? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. If there's no more, more questions, can we break for lunch? Okay, so let me just check the time. We need to be back by 13.15, so quarter past one, please. Okay, thanks. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>